Hello, hello. Welcome back, everyone. This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos. And today I want to talk to you guys about the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. Today we are going to be diving into the very famous sociological work by the German sociologist Max Weber. So any of you guys who did an undergraduate and you took a sociology course, I wouldn't be surprised if you've already read part of this book. Uh, though, despite its importance, uh, often in, in sort of introduction to the field of sociology, a lot of people haven't heard of this book. A lot of people haven't read this book. And so, as Dyer always talks about, I'm going to do your homework. And so, we are going to be covering Max Weber's The Protestant Ethic in the Spirit of Capitalism. This is a very interesting book. Some of the things, again, this is coming from a secular academic. He was not Christian. Uh, he's famous for his comparative study of world religions. He got into Hinduism, studied Sanskrit, um, Buddhism, stuff like that. However, he wrote this book criticizing what he saw as industrial capitalism in a new spirit, a new calling, how people 
began to find their self-worth in their secular work. This was a novelty in history. He was witnessing this, and he was tying it to Protestant theology. And so that's what we're going to be getting into today um, in a very systematic way. Every orange and blue tab you see here, we are going to be reading. And a lot of these excerpts are multiple pages long. So I recommend... Uh, having a notepad out. Uh, this will be useful, and next time you're caught at a dinner party with your socialist friends and they're critiquing capitalism, you could say, well, you know, that's interesting, but I align myself more with the Weberian school and, and Weber's understanding of the Protestant ethic coming out of Luther's call and the predestination of Calvinistic theology. And then you can uh, maybe raise a few eyebrows. So that's what we're going to be getting into um, I do want to say a few things before before we dive in as usual. One, what prompted today's conversation? I thought I was going to be talking about uh, Amazon and um, the uh, serpent of technology. This was actually something that I was planned on streaming on. But as I began to prepare for that stream, much of one, of what I wanted to say... I felt built upon much of the premise of today's video. So today's stream is going to be a little bit more intellectual. It's going to be more of an academic lecture. It's going to be lots of reading. But I promise that if you're able to follow and you're with me to the end of today's stream, it's going to be really useful. I'm telling you that what Weber has to say, though, again, not Christian, not uh, coming from a worldview, especially if you're Orthodox, that, that you would... Uh, find in common with with mr max weber but it's really insightful and i think again you are going to be left today with some insights regarding protestantism how it relates to really the contemporary society how does protestant theology relate to blm prostrations and the sort of new uh, uh sort of almost a cult-like experience in regards to social justice uh a sort of pharise pharisaical pietism out displayed publicly where where does this stuff come from and i think very interestingly the sort of blending of god's providential purpose in your life into a secular framework this is going to be unique this is unique to protestant theology so uh yeah so today's stream then was really i was preparing for the amazon the sort of i, I want to call it the junglefication of culture and the serpent of technology, but I thought so much, again, is going to be built on today. So in the next stream, I'm going to be referring back to today's stream um, quite a bit. So some of the concepts uh, we're going to be diving into today are things like um, worldly asceticism. This is a concept he reiterates over and over and over. So Worldly asceticism, what exactly does that mean? Well, what Weber makes a point of, and we're going to be highlighting, is that Protestantism actually inverts the ascetic practice of Christianity because Protestantism doesn't have monasteries. It doesn't have the monastic dimension to their theology. And so where does that ascetic yearning get placed? What well, actually becomes the duty of every individual person and it's to bear the sort of worldly affairs that exist. That asceticism moves from a monastic life, becoming a monk, and actually your pietistic devotion moving you further away from the world. Protestantism and its worldly asceticism, the ascetic practice actually moves you further and further into the world. So this is going to be really interesting. Again, how, how do these relate? We're going to be looking at spheres of rationality. This is a very important concept Weber talks about, and he uses this in other uh, works, you know, not just the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. He has many important works, but the theory of these spheres of rationalism is really important. Uh, he's not going to get into it too much in this discussion, though he's going to be using the concept of... Uh, <clears throat> um, oh, somebody said the... Uh, hmm, hmm, hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure what's going on with the Streamlabs alert box. Okay. Uh, um, 
no, it's it's uh it's going good. Somebody said it was, it's showing old donations. They're showing me that they're all new. Uh, John, David, these are all in the last five minutes. So John, David, K. Jimmy donated twenty sixty nine. Uh, geez, well, thank you so much, guys. <laughs> Already getting on the getting on the super chats. Thank you very very much. Um, well, without even going for, let me let me do the housekeeping then before we get too much further along in, in the stream because. I know once I start going, I, it's hard for me to slow down. So, number one, thank you all who have gone over to the website and have become website members. I want to say that I have had some technical difficulties on the back end of my website. So, if you are a website member, you may have noticed, well, gee, Patrick, you haven't had any new videos in the last three weeks. What's going on here? I paid for... Yeah, yeah, I understand. No, there's plenty of videos there, I promise. Um... That has just been worked out. There is a brand new video now up on the website for members. It's the nine societal consequences of Protestant theology, something that you can see is tangential to today's lecture. And I also will have um, a video that I'm really excited about. In fact, I may post it on the YouTube channel to tease people to come be, uh, be website members. That's going to be on communion, communication, and community and it's going to be uh, a much uh, deeper conversation on life as communion and looking at this in a variety of ways, the sort of paradox of, um, of communication, the co community, personhood, all these different things. It's going to be really interesting, I promise. It'll be connecting dots. So I'll be doing that, and I think I also am going to be making a video on uh, the psychology of scapegoating and how that relates theologically speaking. So those are three videos that are going to be up this week on the website. The first one, Nine Societal Consequences of Protestant Theology, is already up there. So if you got an account, you've already become a member, that's up there. Check it out. I promise that the other two videos will be up there by Friday. So we have three new educational videos over on the website. If you guys are interested, please be, follow me over on Telegram. Uh, Telegram is, we're having a lot of fun. We have a great group chat if you guys are interested. Here is the, um, the link to that. And for today, also if you guys would like to super chat, obviously some of you guys are already aware of that. Um, this is the Streamlabs uh, link. Please donate over at the Streamlabs uh, link, though if you want to donate, you prefer to donate on YouTube, that is fine as well. Um, we don't discriminate our uh, donational uh, uh, vehicles here at Church of the Eternal Logo. So if you prefer to go over to the website, that is great too. And if you want to help in any way, just become a website member. And I promise there is so much content and value over there that uh, there will be plenty of things to do. Um, so... So that is that. Again, I just posted the link, uh, the link tree link. Become uh, a member over on our Telegram group chat. Guys, Jimmy, Annie, um, B Love, uh, Base Philosophy Mom, we have like tons of fun memeing over in the group chat. It's hilarious. We have great conversations. Uh, Duncan is over there. So go join the Telegram group chat. I'm telling you guys. We have a great time. And also, if you want to do a one-on-one -on -one session, I uh, did one with John. John, we had a great conversation uh, and did one with Cody last week, uh, George. Um, guys, if you Falco, we did one. If you guys are interested in doing a one-on-one -on -one session, go to the website and sign up through there. Okay, now, first thing I want to say is happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. So... Uh, obviously my patron saint, as you can see right here, St. Patrick, uh, is my patron saint and him shooing the snakes off of Ireland, uh, is something I think we're all trying to do, especially in the Western world. The Western world is just a metaphor for Ireland at this point, because it is full of pagan snakes. So happy thing or happy St. Patrick's day to you guys. I know in the Orthodox church, it is the 17th. So the 17th is uh, the Great Lent. Well, you're on the Great Lent fast, but we have um, the pre-sanctified liturgy Wednesday night, tomorrow night at my church, as I'm sure your guys' church does. And so it will celebrate, probably namesake, uh, anybody who's named after St. Patrick or that's their patron saint. So I will be there at my church uh, Wednesday night 
wish you all again a blessed, blessed Lent. Lent has started. We are now on the journey. So happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy Lent, everybody. Hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Now, let's just dive into the wheat. So we're talking about important terms for today's conversation. I want to basically provide you everything you need to know so when we start reading Weber in his own words, which I promise is going to be insightful, you already kind of know what's coming. It's not going to be suspenseful. You're not going to be surprised. You're going to understand it. So the first one was the worldly asceticism. For... for um, Dang, Jimmy said the, um, I'm not sure why the Streamlabs is doing that. Um, <laughs> let me do this. Let me go. I'll, I'll remove the, the Streamlabs. Um, what I could do is remove it. And then... And then add it again, maybe. Okay, I'll do that real quick. Real quick, because I, I want to get going. All right, so now we just added the alert box back up there. Done. Okay, so the alert box should be good to go. I just I just took it off, took it, turned it back on. Uh, should be good to go now, guys. Okay. All right, alert box, good to go. Important terms for today's stream, worldly asceticism. Again, one of the main features of Weber's argument is that what Protestantism does in its uh, really rejection of the traditionality, or for him, the mystical dimension. He's very interested on the mysticism present in previous forms of Christianity, what he called the Orient, or Eastern Orthodox, and then Catholicism. He much more uh, refers back to Catholicism than anything regarding to Orthodoxy, but still applies and how the mysticism gets suppressed within Protestantism, the rationalism rises, and the yearning for the ascetic practice is still there. How, do we, how are we ascetic in a Protestant framework? We don't have monasteries. We don't have the ecclesiastical structure for an ascetic life. In Protestantism, we have what's called a sort of worldly asceticism, or that's what Weber calls it, and they find a, a sort of ascetic appeal in doing one's duty in society. Their work, their occupation, their secular job becomes a sort of ascetic, virtuous act in and of itself. And we're going to speak more to this, so just hang on. Worldly asceticism is a big one. Now, another very big concept for Weber's argument today is Luther's call, the calling and the conception of the calling, uh, Weber argues, is the first sort of domino uh, existing outside the sort of cultural milieu that already gives it, uh, you know, a fertile ground for these things to take off. One of the first doctrinal things or, or movements within Protestantism that he says leads what, what he believes to be a sort of moral language for a capitalistic enterprise that Protestantism provides. He calls it the conception of the call, which... Luther provides. And so Luther adds this new theological dimension in the Reformed theology that we all have a calling, but the calling is no longer within the church because of the ways in which Protestantism is rejecting the former ecclesiastical structure, i.e. Catholicism. And so the calling now is, is being moved into something else. People are having divine calls to actually occupy niches within a secular world. And somehow, this is going to fulfill the same um, divine purpose or divine will that God has for your life, whether that be you're a blacksmith or you're a priest before, obviously, the call, God's calling would only be related to the church or the, or the furthering of his word. But in Protestantism, the call gets disassociated from the church per se, and the call now resides in whatever it is that your sort of secular occupation is, that that is now God's calling for you. Wow, right? This is subtle, but this is a big transition because now we see God calling people and the fulfillment of the sort of meaning of their life being found in their job, in their secular work, in their labor. 
And so you can see how already the calling, the worldly asceticism, these things are uh, just uh, minute aspects of a larger tumbleweed, right? That's really going to get going with Reformed theology. Tied to this, he talks about Calvinist predestination. This is going to be hammered home in today's conversation, is that Calvinist predestination, the doctrine of predestination, he said, also began to form, aided in the formation of a psyche that went out into the world, into the secular world, to show people they were the elect. And so one of the things that Calvin talked about in the doctrine of predestination is that you needed to have sufficient faith. You needed to have the confidence to show other people around you that you were of the elect, right? That you were chosen. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by being very confident in the fact that you are that. And then you display that you're very confident by doing it in the world. And one ways in which these, the, uh, some of these Protestants would do that is by being successful in worldly affairs. That success in worldly affairs tied to the call, tied to the worldly asceticism, is another way in which one could show their chosenness, their electedness amongst other people. And so that, he said, then got tied with a sort of movement in the theme of pietism, right? So, so much of what he's talking about is rationalistic, is the devoid of, of mystical dimension, it's devoid of emotion, but he says, well, what, what Protestantism does is the pietistic movement, pietism itself, is that emotional outlet, and that pietism gets funneled towards our worldly purposes. And so, that emotional pietism that we would have isn't necessarily towards venerative, uh, traditional venerative acts, prostrating in church, venerating an icon. No, it becomes again more worldly. The pietism, the emotional pietism somehow gets tied with our own labor, with our own labor. And so you can see individualism, you can see rationalism, you can see all these things seeping in and influencing the Protestant worldview, the Protestant theological enterprise, and giving rise to so many different things. So that is much of what we're going to be getting to. Guys, please smash that like if you have not. Um, smash that like. And um, Max Weber lived from 1864 to 1920. Okay, so Max Weber, again, a German sociologist, very important scholar of the late 19th century, early 20th century. Anybody who's done an introductory course in sociology knows who Max Weber is, I'm sure. Probably any German uh, probably knows who Max Weber is, too. So what prompted him to write this book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, was this particular question. Why were the districts of highest economic development at the same time favorable to the Reformed Revolution in the church? Right? Why was the places where Protestant Reformation took hold also the places of the highest economic development? That was the, that was the central basis, what got him interested in into this investigation, looking deeper and deeper into what he believed the, the source rooted in Protestant theology, even though, as we will talk about Protestant theology and Protestants and Luther, they wouldn't ever argue what Weber's arguing, that their theology would give rise to capitalism or industrial capitalism. In fact, some of them, as he will talk about, would be absolutely horrified by that's what people are really perceiving where that stuff is going. But these arguments are pretty strong. Are they pretty strong? So I think you're going to enjoy it. Um, another thing I wanted to mention was that when he looked at Catholic versus Protestant nations, there was not the same economic rationalism found in the Catholic nations. What is one of the forms of economic rationalism? Rationalism, so he was talking about efficiency, utilitarianism, um, uh, Systematic methodologies, even central planning, these were tied up in this sort of rationalistic movement. But when they looked, when, when, the, when the mercantile 
people and the merchants went to Catholic nations, they would try to get people to work more by giving them more money. However, it didn't work. And, and, and typically, in what he was arguing, in Catholic nations, people would value not working, their leisure activity. They would rather be paid the same and work less than work more and make more. And so he noticed a, a drastic difference between Protestant and Catholic nations in the way in which they responded to merchants wanting to pay laborers more to work more hours. I think that's really interesting, right? So we see then, uh, as he argues, the natural disposition of all men is to favor their leisure activity. That work is never the means of life. Our purpose, man does not exist to work, but our labor exists for man to fulfill other things. He's saying that this is sort of the natural disposition throughout history, that people use their work, use their labor to provide, um, to provide for their families, for themselves, for their community. But the acquirement of money for the purpose of acquiring money or quote-unquote becoming successful was never the case. Um, um, okay, this alert box is going, it's driving me nuts. Um, why is this thing not <laughs> updated? Oh, jeez. Uh, okay. Anyways, I have no idea why the alert keeps going off. I apologize. Uh, if it keeps doing that, guys, just let me know. I'll turn the dang thing off. I don't want it to be distracting. So, another thing that he noticed is that Protestantism provided the moral language necessary to see secular work as God's calling, never, as he talked about, from his understanding of other world religions or within Christianity specific, uh, speaking generally, or generally speaking, that at no point was God's calling tied to a secular work in the acquirement of wealth or anything through secular means. So, okay, I'm turning off this thing. Uh, alert. This makes... Uh, I have no idea why it keeps going off. Um, so anyways, um, so Protestantism provided the moral language and then economic rationalism arises from the over-rationalization of the world of which Protestantism itself greatly influenced and shaped. So he talks about the uh, the rationalization of the world and this he talked about again at this time in history the, the the differentiation between magic religion and science was a big deal this was the this was a major theoretical contention amongst religious scholars of religion sociological scholars psychological scholars um looking at religion what is magic? What is religion? What is science? The general consensus of this period, as you can imagine, is going to take a, an evolutionary schematic. They're going to see magic as superstitious and primitive, and that magic becomes more systematized, written down, it becomes literate, it becomes more dogmatic. That's then what unifies a community, and we call that religion. But religion and magic are both a misunderstanding of the causal mechanisms of reality. And so, as man evolved, he eventually adopted science. This was their general consensus at this time. You can look up Fraser, uh, Weber, uh, uh, Durkheim, you know, this was the kind of general academic language and, and thought process regarding these things. So he talks about how he's actually very critical. Weber's actually kind of critical of the over-rationalization of the world, even though, again, he's not necessarily Christian. He favors a world which holds a mystical, uh, unknowable, uh, miraculous possibility. And he says that Protestantism is continually squashing that out. And Protestantism is a result of society itself generally doing that, trying to, trying to disregard itself from all types of superstition 
into in order to better know what reality is, right? So we're moving towards the enlightenment. We're moving towards secular scientific inductive processes um, as sort of institutional practice for how we know the world. So this over-rationalization is related to a society devoted to, as I said, efficiency, utilitarianism, uh, systematic methodologies, and central planning are, are byproducts of a society that is over-rationalized. And I think that's really, really interesting, right? Um, because the, the efficiency, the utilitarianism, uh, the systematic methodology, we can see central planning, these playing out in our own world right now in 20, 2021. And I think, too, especially the utilitarianism, I mean, it holds seeds of the relativism, of the subjectivism that plagues Protestantism, generally speaking, due to sola scriptura and the way in which they interpret scripture infinitely and can't justify any one interpretation as superior to another. So, um, some of the interesting things I think we should keep in mind as we begin our reading is that Protestant rationalism lacks a deep physical dimension. One of the things that Protestantism does in its movement towards an over-rationalistic approach is that it does away with the sort of physicality of worship, the physicality of religion. What do I mean by that? As we will see, their worldly asceticism becomes an anti-aesthetic so as, as Protestantism sees the sort of ascetic calling out into the world to, to occupy, to have a niche, to do commerce, we'll see them also be very antagonistic to anything deemed superstitious uh, or really the whole process of, athet- of aesthetics, generally speaking. So aesthetics, physical worship, like prostration, you're not going to get that. Uh, veneration of physical things, you're not going to get that. That's considered superstitious. That's considered pagan. Uh, what about incense, olfactory dimensions within your worship? You're also not going to get that in the Protestant context, again, because it's not about bodily worship. It's about rational understanding. Ration, and that's, so you can even see that in the Sola Fide. It's a rational proclamation of faith is what saves me not the mystery of God's mercy and grace. That's not what saves me. It's my own rational proclamation uh, because I'm such a wretched piece that thank God that he will accept me due to the penal substitution of Christ. That's how they would understand it. So uh, those are are worth keeping in mind. Also, their emphasis on the legalism of the Old Testament fosters a pharisaical spirit. This is true, and he will also talk about this, and I think when we highlight this, it will become very interesting even how we could interpret modern-day BLM and social justice warriors and virtue signaling as that pharisaical spirit, but it's so, it's so rampant in our society, and we don't even know where it comes from. And then the, a selfish soteriology. One of the things that Weber argues is that the predestination of Calvinism forces everybody to be so preoccupied with their own salvation, with their own election of being one of the elect, that it forces further and further individualism and further individualism in regards to one soteriology because only you can save yourself through your own confidence and faith. This is very different, as he highlights, from a soteriological point of view of orthodoxy or Catholicism, which is much more communal. It's much more sacramental. It's found in the church. It's much more uh, of a group thing, right? You confess to the church. There is no confession in Protestantism. Right? And so he talks about some of these stuff. And the last thing that I want to say before we just start reading and getting into it is um, he talks about Ben Franklin. And he, he's using Ben Franklin to highlight what he calls the Anglo-American sort of uh, Protestant spirit. And what, he, and what he means and what he's—I'm not going to read this section. I just want to highlight so when you hear the references, you know what's going on. He's using an excerpt of Ben Franklin talking about business and and really the virtue of becoming a businessman and doing commerce and, and being a you know a somebody in society with the phrase that time is money. Time is money. And so he's he's connecting that concept. Time is money is a concept that has never appeared in human history before that. Money and time, most people would rather spend their time not trying to make money, historically speaking. What is it that arose? 
historically in a, in a brief context that now it seems so obvious that t- to waste time is to waste money. And somehow by doing that, you're not being virtuous. And all of us who are American, that kind of resonates. We feel that, right? You don't even probably, maybe you haven't consciously thought about it, but time is money. I know I think about that during the day. I'm trying to get as much done, doing all this stuff. It's like, I want to be as productive as I can, as efficient as I can. And somehow that is tied with an idea of virtuosity. But where did that come from? That's not a historical concept. And what we see is that's because us who are Americans, us who maybe grow up in any sort of Protestant nation who find that a common phrase, that's where we get it. We get it due to some of the things that are going to be brought up in Max Weber's discussion of the Protestant ethic, of somehow that our calling is in the world, our duty is in the world, our ascetic practice is in the world, and therefore it is you are unvirtuous if you are not engaging in the call that God has called you to. So therefore your whole life is a call to labor. Your whole life is a call to enterprise. This is new. This is a revolution in theology, a revolution in thought. So, without further ado, let's start hearing Max Weber in his own words. Um, And so, guys, I'll be caught up mostly reading, so if anything's going on, you guys need my attention. Uh, I will be checking in on the chat, so you can try to grab my attention there. Um, I do want to highlight, please smash that like if you have just joined... And let's get going. So the first section uh, that I want to read from is actually like chapter one. And and I, again, if you guys have notes, if you're taking notes, I do think it will be useful because at points it will be dense. And we're reading the horse's mouth, guys. This is basically, you know, you go to a a sociology class, it'll be a two-week course on this book. We're going to do it in two hours. So the re- chapter one's on the religious affiliation and social stratification. And this is basically him highlighting the problem, him seeing what's going on in society and then trying to tell you what he's going to argue throughout this book. So I just found this, this useful for kind of framing, giving us a framework to understand what we're about to hear. So we are on page 39, and it reads, In the past, they have, unlike the Protestants, undergone no particularly prominent economic development in the times when they were persecuted or only tolerated, either in Holland or in England. On the other hand, it is a fact that the Protestants, especially certain branches of the movement, to be fully discussed later, both as ruling classes and as a as ruled, both as majority and as minority, have shown a special tendency to develop economic rationalism, which cannot be observed in the same extent among Catholics, either in one situation or the other. Thus, the principal explanation of this difference must be sought in the permanent intrinsic character of their religious beliefs, and not only in their temporary external historical political situations." So uh, he goes on by saying, it will be our task to investigate these religions with a view to finding out what particular, what peculiarities they have or have had, which might have resulted in the behavior we have described on superficial analysis and on the basis of certain current impressions. One might be tempted to express the difference by saying that the, that the greater otherworldliness of Catholicism, the ascetic character of its highest ideals, must have brought up its adherence to a greater indifference toward the good things of this world. Such an explanation fits the popular tendency in the judgment of both religions. On the Protestant side, it is used as a basis of criticism of those ascetic ideals of the Catholic way of life, where the Catholics answer with the accusation that materialism results from the secularization of all ideals through Protestantism. Protestantism secularizes all its ideals. Interesting. Or at least carry that ideal with you, that ideal with you. <clears throat> One recent writer has attempted to formulate the difference of their attitudes towards economic life in the following manner. The Catholic is quieter, having less of the acquisitive impulse 
His, he prefers a life of the greatest possible security, even with a smaller income, to a life of risk and incitement, even though it may bring the chance of gaining honor and riches. The proverb says jokingly, either eat well or sleep well. In the present case, the Protestant prefers to eat well and the Catholic prefers to sleep undisturbed. So this is really interesting. I see right there, we can already see the sort of ethos of America is that second one to a life of risk, a life of excitement, a life of chance, a life of honor, a life of riches. These are things that people should set out on a journey to acquire, right? And that's what he was saying, that the, the, the mental framework of the Protestant is to acquire things. Or this is what, what he was saying isn't the case necessarily for the Catholic. Now, we're going to uh, move further into the book. And now we're actually going to get into the, the real first chapter. It's called The Spirit of Capitalism. The Spirit of Capitalism. <clears throat> and we're going to be reading an excerpt um, on page 59. So it reads... A man, for instance, who at the rate of one mark per acre mowed two and a half acres per day and earned two and a half marks, when the rate was raised to one and a quarter marks per acre mowed, not three acres, as he might easily have done, thus earning 375 marks, but only two acres, so that he could still earn the two and a half marks to which he was accustomed. The opportunity of earning more was less attractive than that of working less. He did not ask, how much can I earn in a day if I do as much work as possible? But how much must I work in order to earn the wage, two and a half marks, which I earned before and which takes care of my traditional needs? This is an example of what is here meant by traditionalism. A man does not, by nature, wish to earn more and more money, but simply to live as he is accustomed to live and to earn as much as is necessary for that purpose. Wherever modern capitalism has began its work of increasing the productivity of human labor by increasing its intensity, it has encountered the immensely stubborn resistance of this leading trait of pre-capitalistic labor. And today it encounters it the more, the more backward the laboring forces are with which it has to deal. And so uh, we're obviously seeing a major difference between uh, the capitalistic mindset and the pre-capitalistic. And so this goes on. We are now on page 62. What is meant can again best be explained by means of an example. The type of backward traditional form of labor is today very often exemplified by women workers. Guys, late 19th century, he's talking about women workers in the workforce. He's not exactly positive about it either. <clears throat> Especially unmarried ones. An almost universal complaint of employers of girls, for instance, German girls, is that they are almost entirely unable and unwilling to give up methods of work inherited or once learned in favor of more efficient ones, to adapt themselves to new methods, to learn to concentrate their intelligence, or even to use it at all. <laughs> Subtle jab. Explanations of the possibility of making work easier, above all more profitable to themselves, generally encounter a complete lack of understanding. Increases of peace rates are... Yeah, piece rates, like each piece of something. That's what. So this word he uses quite a bit. I don't want to be confused by it. But piece rates, he's talking about really the price of individual commodities. That's another way to say it. Increases of piece rates are without avail against the stone wall of habit. In general, it is otherwise in that it is a point of no little importance from our point of view. Only with girls having a specifically religious, especially a pietistic background, one often hears a statistical investi in, and statistical investigation confirms it that by far the best chances of economic education are found among this group. The ability of mental concentration as well as the absolutely essential feeling of obligation to one's job 
are here most often combined with a strict economy, which calculates the possibility of high earnings and a cool self-control and frugality, which enormously increases performance. This provides the most favorable foundation for the conception of labor as an end in itself, as a calling which is necessary to capitalism. The chances of overcoming traditionalism are greatest on account of the religious upbringing. So what did he just say? The greatest resistance to that natural disposition, inclination of man to not want to work more, only to work to provide for his life. And then he wants to go spend time with his family. He wants to enjoy his time. Time is not always money. Time is something different. Money is something you make just for a brief period to uphold the family in your general needs. But he say, what is the best way, the best way that they found to get people out of that traditionalism, right? To not want to work more. It was their religious upbringing that the biggest difference to seeing how people are willing to work for more money or refuse to work for more money, just want to make as much as they had and work less is their religious upbringing. Very, very interesting. This observation of present-day capitalism in itself suggests that it is worthwhile to ask how this connection of adaptability to, to capitalism with religious factors may have come about in the days of the early development of capitalism, for that they were even then present in much the same form can be inf inferred from numerous facts. For instance, the dislike and the persecution which Methodist workmen in the 18th century met at the hands of their comrades were not solely nor even principally the result of their religious eccentricities. England had seen many of those and much more striking ones. It rested rather as the destruction of their tools repeatedly mentioned in the reports suggests upon their specific willingness to work as we should say today. So what is he saying? The persecution against Methodists in England wasn't their, wasn't their, their theology, wasn't the eccentricities of their doctrine. It was the fact they wouldn't stop working. And that, that efficiency, again, that, that, that really devoting yourself to the industrial capitalistic enterprise grows that enterprises and forces everyone around you to have to adopt that same worldview. That's why they wanted to destroy the Methodist tools. They wanted them to stop working all the time. Interesting, right? Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> So let's move on here. I uh, got tons of excerpts to read. So this one is here. We got a multiple page excerpt. This should be a good one. <clears throat> okay, that goes down to. One is tempted to think, and by the way, if you're following, if you guys have the book, this is page 70. I'm on page 70 now. One is tempted to think that these personal moral qualities have not the slightest relation to any ethical maxims to say nothing of religious ideas, but that the essential relation between them is negative. The ability to free oneself from the common tradition, a sort of liberal enlightenment seems likely to be the most suitable basis for such a businessman's success. And today, that is generally precisely the case. Any relationship between religious beliefs and conduct is generally absent. And where any exists, at least in Germany, it tends to be of the negative sort. The people filled with the spirit of capitalism today tend to be indifferent, if not hostile, to the church. The thought of the pious boredom of paradise has little attraction for their active natures. Religion appears to them as a means of drawing people away from labor in this world. If you ask them, what is the meaning of their restless activity? Why they are never satisfied with what they have, thus appearing so senseless 
to any purely worldly view of life, they would perhaps give the answer, if they know any at all, quote, to provide for my children and grandchildren, unquote. But more often, and since that motive is not peculiar to them, but was just as effective for the traditionalists, more correctly and simply, that business with its continuous work has become a necessary part of our lives. That is, in fact, the only possible motivation, but it is at the same time expresses what is seen from the viewpoint of personal happiness so irrational about this sort of life, where a man exists for the sake of his business instead of the reverse. Of course, the desire for the power and recognition which the mere fact of wealth brings plays its part. When the imagination of a whole people has once been turned toward purely quantitative bigness, as in the United States, this romanticism of numbers exercises an irresistible appeal to the poets among businessmen. Otherwise, it is in general not the real leaders, and especially not the permanently successful entrepreneurs who are taken in by it. In particular, the resort to entailed estates and the nobility, with sons whose conduct at the university and uh, and in the offices, in the officer's corpse, tries to cover up their social origin, as has been the typical history of German capitalistic uh, families, is a product of later decadence. The ideal type of the capitalistic entrepreneur, as it has been represented even in Germany by occasional outstanding examples, has no relation to such more or less refined climbers. He avoids ostentation and unnecessary expenditure, as well as conscious enjoyment of his power and is embarrassed by the outward signs of his social recognition which he receives. His manner of life is, in other words, often, and we shall have to investigate the historical significance of just this important fact, distinguished by a certain ascetic tendency. This is the worldly asceticism idea he's introducing. As appears clearly enough in the Sermon of Franklin. He's talking about Ben Franklin and that idea that time is money. How does time get equated to money and why is it virtuous to always work? That's what he's highlighting. Enough, to the, enough in the Sermon of Franklin, which we have quoted. It is, namely, by no means exceptional, but rather the rule for him to have a sort of modesty, which is essentially more honest than the reserve which Franklin so shrewdly recommends. He gets nothing out of his wealth for himself except a rational sense of having done his job well. The capitalistic system so needs this devotion to the calling of making money. It is an attitude toward material goods which is so well suited to that system, so intimately bound up with the conditions of survival and the economic struggle for existence, that there can today no longer be any question of a necessary connection of that acquisitive, meaning acquire, that's how it's spelled, that acquisitive manner of life. In fact, it no longer needs the support of any religious force and feels the attempts of religion to influence economic life insofar as they can still be felt at all to be as much an unjustified interference as its regulation by the state. So what are we seeing then? What he's talking about is the secularism, this movement towards the worldly asceticism, this movement towards our calling, our, our God-given providential calling becoming our secular work. It actually... Uh, furthers secularism itself, right? Protestant theology insinuates secularism, right? <clears throat> and so this is really interesting that as, as these process go along, once these presuppositions are rooted in the society, you don't need Protestantism to keep it going. The spirit of capitalism will keep it going. That the spirit, the, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism become joined. Uh, um, so very, very good stuff there. Now we are moving to chapter three, and this is going to get really interesting because now he's going to get into Luther's conception of the call. So we're going to focus in chapter three on Luther and this idea of the call and how 
historically, especially within the Christianity, our call was always in relationship to the church. Maybe your calling was to be an apologist. Maybe your calling was to be a monk. Maybe your calling was to be a priest. Maybe your calling was to be a bishop. Maybe your calling was to do something with the laity. But your calling was always associated with the church. And Protestantism, given their negation of tradition, your call is now moves outside the church. And so he's rooting the beginning of this idea with Luther himself. So check this out. So I'm going to read half the first paragraph because I think this is insightful. So we're looking at Luther's conception of the call. Again, our divine calling be moved outside the church and into the secular world. Now it is unmistakable that even in the German word beruf, and perhaps still more clearly in the English calling, a religious conception, that of a task set by God, is at least suggested. The more emphasis is put upon the word in a concrete case, the more evident is the connotion. And if we trace the history of the word through civilized languages, it appears that neither the predominantly Catholic peoples nor those of classical antiqu antiquity have possessed any expression or similar uh, connotation for what we know as a calling in the sense of a life task, a definite field in which to work while one has existed for all predominantly Protestant peoples. Interesting. Like the meaning of the word, and he means not the logos, he means the word calling, the calling. <clears throat> like the meaning of the word, the idea is new, a product of the Reformation. This may be assumed as generally known. It is true that certain suggestions of the positive valuation of routine activity in the world, which is contained in this conception of the calling, had already existed in the Middle Ages and even in later Hellenistic antiquity. We shall speak of that later. And just before I get any further, he has a section that I'm not going to be reading to you guys on um, form uh, points that would be people who would be arguing against him pointing at capitalism existing in previous times, ancient China, uh, ancient Egypt, but really the, the exchange of commerce. And what he highlights is that that is not the spirit of capitalism. That commerce, though, if we're going to use a really broad definition of capitalism as the exchange of capital of some sort, okay, yeah, sure, those, those, those commerce exchanges were a form of capital. But he would say capitalism, the spirit of capitalism, it, no, it's something different. It is about the idea that it is, it, it is virtuous to acquire more money, to work for more money. Now, again, he'll, he's going to highlight how even some of these Protestant churches and denominations that, that have this idea, they would also say that displaying your wealth is bad, uh, enjoying your wealth is bad. That's, like a, that's too much being rooted in your pleasures. And so it's like this weird irony they have to deal with, that, that the virtuous calling to the world to work more and more and more, and then also then not wanting to like display their wealth or show their wealth or flaunt their wealth. But he highlights that nowhere at, in human history has, have people devoted their lives for the sole acquisition of money or goods. That this is an entirely new phenomenon. And that is what he's tying to what he's calling the spirit of capitalism. So, it existed in the Middle Ages and in Hellenistic antiquity. We shall speak of that later, but at least one thing was unquestionably new. The valuation of the fulfillment of duty and worldly affairs was the highest form which the moral activity of the individual could assume. That is, that, I mean, sorry, this is what, which inevitably gave everyday worldly activity a religious significance and which first created the conception of a calling in this sense. The conception of the calling thus brings out the central dogma of all Protestant denominations which the Catholic division of ethical precepts into precepta and concilia discards. The only way of living acceptab acceptably to God was not to surpass worldly morality in monastic asceticism but solely through the fulfillment of the obligations imposed upon the individual by his position in the world. That is his calling. 
Luther developed the conception in the course of the first decade of his activity as a reformer, at first quite in harmony with the prevailing tradition of the Middle Ages, as represented, for example, by Thomas Aquinas. He thought of activity in the world as a thing of the flesh, even though willed by God. It is the indispensable neutral, or I'm, I'm sorry, it is the indispensable natural condition of a life of faith, but in itself, like eating and drinking, drinking morally neutral. But with the development of the conception of sola fide, uh, meaning faith alone, all its consequences and its logical results, the increasingly sharp emphasis against the Catholic concilia evangelica of the monks and the dictates of the devil, the calling grew in importance. The monastic life is not only quite devoid of value as a means of justification before God, but he also looks upon its renunciation of the duties of this world as a product of selfishness, withdrawing from temporal obligations. This is a big one, right? Because this is the difference in the idea of asceticism. Remember, I highlighted the concept of worldly asceticism. From the dictates of the new Protestant Reformed theology, one of the reasons why they don't have monastics, one of the reasons why they don't have real traditional ascetics, is because they deem that to be selfish. To just take, your, to take yourself out of society, well, that's selfish. That's selfish because in our theology, the worldly asceticism that's already presumed is that your duty is what you should, you should be in the world, doing your work, glorifying God, glorifying Him, right? Showing for the Calvinists your election, your presence among the elect. That's what you should be doing. So very interesting how they flip their relationship to the ascetic practice of the monks. That's selfish. And what's unselfish is devoting yourself fully to your own work. That's the unselfish ascetic practice of the Protestant. Very interesting. In contrast, labor in a calling appears to him as the outward expression of brotherly love. This he proves by the observation that the division of labor forces every individual to work for others. But his viewpoint is highly naive, forming an almost grotesque contrast to Adam Smith's well-known statements on the same subject. However, this justification, which is evidently essentially scholastic, soon disappears again, and there remains, more and more strongly emphasized, the statement that the fulfillment of worldly duties is under all circumstances the only way to live acceptably to God. It And it alone is the will of God and hits every legitimate calling has exactly the same worth in the sight of God. So, I want to highlight two things there that when I read that, so we see the difference in asceticism, we see the sort of worldly callingness to our ascetic practices to, to do your duty, but that, that last thing, that... Every legitimate calling has exactly the same worth in the sight of God. I can't help but connect that again to the abstractness of individualism, which uh, I know we've talked about Marshall McLuhan, and he's talked about sensory ratios and, and the transition and how the printing press began to change our sensory ratios and concepts of atomized individuals, individualism tied to the way in which letters worked in a printing press, the, the, form, uh, the uh, uni uniformity of letters in a printing press presents a new framework, a new mental framework for the uniformality of the world, that all people are the same. They're just individuals. Therefore, all jobs in a factory are just positions that can be filled by these individuals. And so it's all equal. And I couldn't help but think that the calling, how all callings now in this new uh, Protestant framework have equal worth to the eyes of God seems, again, taking the sort of same presuppositional framework. Because it'd be interesting to ask an Orthodox priest, do, does, is everybody's calling worth the same in the eyes of God? I would have to say no. Not everybody is a saint. 
Uh, not everybody has done those things. Maybe, maybe the Orthodox, this again, I would need a priest, somebody uh, deeper in a, like a, a clergy, somebody in clergy to represent and, and speak to me on this topic. But um, I wouldn't think that all callings are equal from an Orthodox perspective because, uh, you know, not everybody has the same gifts. You know, Scripture talks about some people having five talents and some people having one talent. And if you're not actualizing that one talent, God may take that one talent away from you. You have no talents. So God, the worth of, of us being made in the image is all equal. But I don't know if our calling or our talents or our abilities or how we are, uh, what we're supposed to do in society in regards to the church, right? Because from an Orthodox perspective, our calling is going to have to be tied to the furthering of God's word or the church or something of that nature. So I don't know. Interesting thought there. But uh, that that was a good. Now I have another paragraph, uh, real quick one that I wanted to share with you guys. In the first place, it is hardly necessary to point out that Luther cannot be claimed for the spirit of capitalism in the sense which we have used that term above, or for that matter, in any sense whatsoever. Okay, so this is important. Weber is not saying that Luther gave rise to capitalism. Not at all. All he's saying, and, 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 and he goes further in this, and I don't even know if I have it all filled, um, that the, Luther's calling... It's not that he was promoting capitalism or he was a capitalist or he, he you know, he's, he's for free markets. No, is that Luther had the conception of the call. And what was revolutionary is the call became disassociated with the church. And the call and everybody's individual call now resided in the secular world. That is is the big transition that is the big psychological movement that leads you can see that is the tumbleweed that's going to build and build and build and build on to what we call the spirit of capitalism so luther cannot be claimed for the spirit of capitalism in the sense in which we have used that term above or for that matter in any sense whatsoever the religious circles which today most enthusiastically celebrate the great achievements of the Reformation are by no means friendly to capitalism in any sense. And Luther himself would, without a doubt, have sharply repudiated any connection with a point of view like that of Benjamin Franklin, that time is money. Okay, so Weber is not saying that the people who come up with these ideas are conscientious or deliberately trying to create the spirit of capitalism that, again, is fully embodied, as he said, is within the American project and somebody like a Benjamin Franklin. <clears throat> okay, next section I want to read to you guys. Um, <clears throat> in the apostolic era, as expressed in the New Testament, especially in St. Paul, the Christian looked upon worldly activity either with indifference or at least essentially traditionalistically. For those first generations were filled with ecclesi uh, I'm sorry, with eschatological hopes. Eschatology is just a study of the end times, right? So you're saying eschatological hopes are the hopes of the second coming, the end of history. Since everyone was simply waiting for the coming of the Lord, there was nothing to do but remain in the station and in the worldly occupation in which the Lord had called and found, I'm sorry, which the call of the Lord had found him and labor as before. Thus he would not burden his brothers in a, as an object of charity, and it would only be for a little while. Luther read the Bible through the spectacles of, this whole, of his whole attitude, and the time... I'm sorry, at that, at the time and in the course of development from about 1518 to 1530, this was not only reminded traditionalistic, but became ever more so. In the first years of his activity as a reformer, he was since thought of the calling as primarily of the flesh, dominated by an attitude closely related insofar as the form of the world activity was concerned Hold on, that sentence does not read well. Okay, restart. 
He thought of his calling as primarily of the flesh, dominated by an attitude closely related insofar as the form of the world activity was concerned. To the Pauline, eschatological indifference was expressed in 1 Corinthians. One may attain salvation in any walk of life. On the short pilgrimage of life, there is no use in laying weight on the form of occupation. The pursuit of material gain beyond personal needs must thus appear as a symptom of a lack of grace. And since it can only apparently be attained at the expense of others, directly reprehensible. As he became increasingly involved in the affairs of the world, he came to value work in the world more highly. But in the concrete calling an individual pursued, he saw more and more of a special command of God to fulfill these peculiar duties which the divine will had imposed upon him. And after the conflict with the fanatics and the peasant disturbances, the objective historical order of things in which the individual has been placed by God becomes for Luther more and more a direct manifestation of divine will. The stronger and stronger emphasis on the providential element, even in particular events of life, led more and more to a traditionalistic interpretation based upon the idea of providence. The individual should remain once and for all in the station and calling which God had placed him and should restrain his worldly activity within the limits imposed by his established station in life. While his economic traditionalism was originally the result of a Pauline indifference, it later became that of a more and more intense belief in divine providence, which identified absolute obedience to God's will with absolute acceptance of things as they were. Starting from this background, it was impossible for Luther to establish a new or in any way fundamental connection between worldly activity and religious principles. His acceptance of purity of doctrine as the one infallible criterion of the church, which became more and more irrevocable after the struggles of the 20s, was in itself sufficient to check the development of new points of view in ethical matters. So what he goes on to say uh even further is that Luther was, he did not take the calling as far as, as the people after him did. You see, he created the conception of the calling. It is now divorced somewhat from the church because of the nature of Protestantism, though he's trying to keep that Pauline St. Paul, that indifference, right? We should be indifferent to our secular job. Our secular job should not be necessarily tied to our salvation. Um, but he, and he's saying Luther also agreed with that. However, as he'll highlight, we move through many of the reformers had different understandings. So, um, I want to, I want to highlight this section here. I think this is a real good one. Um, and then we'll move on to the next chapter. <clears throat> now this is wrapping up again, Luther's conception of the call. Now that may be partly explained on purely political grounds. Although the Reformation is unthinkable without Luther's own personal religious development and was spiritually long influenced by his personality, without Calvinism, his work could not have permanent concrete success. Nevertheless, the reason for this common repugnance of Catholics and Lutherans lies, at least partly, in the ethical peculiarities of Calvinism. A purely superficial glance shows that there is here quite a different relationship between the religious life and earthly activity than in the Catholicism or Lutheranism. You see what he's saying is Lutheranism is a little bit of a different strand. It's, it's a little bit more traditional than uh, what comes after. Even in literature, motivated purely by religious factors, that is evident. Take, for instance, the end of the Divine Comedy, where the poet in paradise stands speechless in his passive contemplations of the secrets of God, and compare that with the poem which has come to be called the Divine Comedy of Puritanism. Milton closes the last song of Paradise Lost after describing the expulsion from paradise as follows. They, looking back, all the eastern side beheld, of paradise so late their happy seat, Waved over by that flaming brand, 
the gate, with dreadful faces thronged and fiery arms. Some natural tears they dropped, but wiped them soon. The world was all before them, there to choose their place of rest and providence their guide. So we see what in that framework, a very optimistic, a very hopeful understanding of the fall from paradise in, in, in man's movement out into the world, very different from the divine comedy. And only a little before Michael had said to Adam, deeds to thy knowledge answerable, add faith, add virtue, patience, temperance, add love. By name to come called charity, the soul, of all the rest, then wilt thou not be loth to leave this paradise, but shall possess a paradise within thee, happier far. So what, what, why is that useful? Because it's insinuating that the paradise lost and the paradise found is going to be inside the individual and it's going to be superior to that in which we fell from. So we see a sort of individualism, a subjectivism, uh, an interiorization of, of sorts. This is all going on. <clears throat> One feels at once that this powerful expression of the Puritan's serious attention to this world, his acceptance of his life in the world as a task could not possibly have come from the pen of a medieval writer, but it is just as a congenial to Lutheranism, as expressed, for instance, in Luther and Paul Gerhard's Chorals. It is now our task to replace this vague feeling by a somewhat more precise logical formation and to investigate the fundamental basis of these differences. The appeal to national character is generally a mere confession of ignorance. And in this case, it is entirely untenable to, as to ascribe a unified national character to the Englishman of the 17th century would be to simply falsify history. Cavaliers and roundheads did not appeal to each other simply as two parties, but as radically distinct species of men, and whoever looks into that matter carefully must agree with them. On the other hand, a difference of character between the English merchant adventurers and the old Hanseatic merchants is not to be found, nor can any other fundamental difference between the English and German characters at the end of the Middle Ages, which cannot easily be explained by the differences of their political history. It was the power of religious influence, not alone, but more than anything else, which created the differences which we are conscious of today. Okay, so now, now we're going to get into it. Um, okay, so now we're looking at the religious foundations of worldly asceticism. The relig religious foundations of worldly asceticism. Smash that like, guys, if you haven't. Uh, greatly appreciate that. Again, uh, smash that like. Sorry if I sound like a broken record. Also, uh, Feel free to follow. Here is my link tree. Uh, join us in our group chat. So. Okay, now we're on chapter four. Chapter four, the religious foundations of worldly asceticism. And in this chapter, we're going to be going through Calvinism, the pietistic movement, Methodism and the Baptist. And we're going to be looking at specifically their theological doctrines, their theological structure, and how that, again, relates to the spirit of capitalism, because all of them contributed something a little bit different. So, beginning chapter four, pietism first split off from the Calvinistic movement in England and especially in Holland. It remained loosely connected with orthodoxy, meaning, or again, when he, what he calls orthodoxy, he's not referring to Eastern Orthodoxy. He's referring to, um, uh, like, he refers to Luther's form of Lutheranism as orthodox. Uh, so he just means uh, sort of the, the, the general intended form of theology. I just wanted to highlight that. Shading off from it by imperceptible gradations until the end of the 17th century, it was absorbed into Lutheranism under Spencer's leadership. 
Though the dogmatic adjustment was not entirely satisfactory, it remained a movement within the Lutheran Church. Only the faction dominated by Zinzendorf and affected by lingering Hussite and Calvinistic influence within the Moravian Brotherhood was forced, like Methodism, against its will to form a peculiar sort of sect. Calvinism and Baptism were, at the beginning of their development, sharply opposed to each other. But in the baptism of the latter part of the 17th century, they were in close contact. And even in the independent sects of England and Holland at the beginning of the 17th century, the transition was not abrupt. As pietism shows, the transition to Lutheranism is also gradual. And the same is true for Calvinism and the Anglican Church. Though both in external character and in the spirit of its most logical adherence, the latter is more closely related to Catholicism. It is true that both the mass of the adherents and especially the staunchest champions of the ascetic movement, which, in the broadest sense of a highly ambiguous word, has been called Puritanism, did attack the foundations of Anglicanism. But even here, the differences were only gradually worked out in the course of the struggle. Even if, for the present, we quit, we, I'm sorry, in... <laughs> We quite ignore the questions of government and organization, which do not interest us here. The facts are just the same. The dogmatic differences, even the most important, such as those over the doctrines of predestination and justification, were combined in the most complex way. And even at the beginning of the 17th century, regularly, though not without ex exception, prevented the maintenance of unity in the church. Above all, the types of moral conduct in which we are interested may be found in a similar manner among the adherents of the most various denominations derived from one of the four sources mentioned above or a combination of several of them. We shall see that similar ethical maxims may be correlated with very different dogmatic foundations. Also, the important literary tools for the saving of souls above all causative compendia of the various denominations influenced each other in the course of time. One finds great similarities in them in spite of very great differences in actual conduct. So now he goes uh, amongst the difference. So now we're going to look at Calvinism. So what does he have to say about Calvinism specifically? Well, here we go. And this is going to be a bit of a longer guy. Um... I'm not sure where this one ends. Okay. <clears throat> um, two paths leading to it were possible. So he's talking about, um, you know, so again, we're, we're in the, we're in the Calvinist section, Calvinism, and he's, well, I'll just read the beginning. Now Calvinism was the faith over which the great political and cultural struggles of the 16th and 17th centuries were fought in the most highly developed countries, the Netherlands, England, and France. And it we shall hence turn first. And so then he gives a little kind of the summation of, of Calvinism. Then he looks at all the, uh, uh, the Westminster Con Confession of Faith. So he goes through that systematically. And now we move into him talking about all that. Two paths leading to it were possible. The phenomenon of the religious sense of grace is combined in the most active and passionate of those great worshipers which Christianity has produced again and again since Augustine with the feeling of certainty that that grace is the sole product of an objective power and not in the least to an attributed to personal worth. The powerful feeling of lighthearted assurance in which the tremendous pressure of their sense of sin is released, apparently breaks over them with elemental force and destroys every possibility of the belief that this overpowering gift of grace could owe anything to their own cooperation or could be connected with achievements or qualities of their own faith and will. At the time of Luther's greatest religious creativeness, when he was capable of writing his, and this is German, so I am butchering it. Sorry if you guys are German. It's like the Freiheit Einus Christen Menschen. God's secret decree was also to him most definitely the sole and ultimate source of his state of religious grace. 
Even later, he did not formally abandon it. But not only did the idea not assume a central position for him, but it receded more and more into the background. And the more his position as responsible head of the church forced him into practical politics, uh, Mella Clinton quite deliberately avoided adopting dark and dangerous teaching in the Augsburg Confession. And for the church, Af and for the church fathers of Lutheranism, it was an article of faith that grace was revocable and could be won again by penitent humility and faithful trust in the word of God in the sacrament. So why is that important? He's highlighting that in Lutherism, you could lose your, um, your grace, your ability to enter the kingdom, right? Which is, this is true for Orthodox theology as well. Uh, there is a tie, you know, you can't just make a proclamation of faith. You also have to live in accordance to that faith. So you can lose your salvation to a degree. Um, that is what he's highlighting is present within Lutheranism. And he's getting ready to say that is very different than Calvin's predestination. So Luther is more consistent with the historical teaching of the church. With Calvin, the process was just the opposite. The significance of the doctrine for him increased. Perceptibility in the course of his polemical controversies with theological opponents is not fully developed until the third edition of his Institutes and only gained its position of central prominence after his death and the great struggles with the synods of Dordrecht and Westminster sought to put an end to. With Calvin, the uh, decrectum horrible is derived not, as with Luther, from the religious experience, but from the th logical necessity of his thought. Therefore, its importance increases with every increase in the logical consistency of that religious thought. The interest of it is solely in God, not in man. God does not exist for men, but men for the sake of God. All creation, including, of course, the fact, as it undoubtedly was for Calvin, that only a small proportion of men are chosen for eternal grace, can have any meaning only as means to the glory and majesty of God. To apply earthly standards of justice to his sovereign decrees is meaningless and an insult to his majesty, since he and he alone is free, i.e. is subject to no law. So you, what he's doing is he's highlighting the, he's going through the sort of logic of Calvinism, although he disagrees. So we're not saying this is Christianity. We're talking about this is Calvinism. <clears throat> His decrees can only be understood by or even known to us insofar as it has been his pleasure to reveal them. We can only hold to these fragments of eternal truth. Everything else, including the meaning of our individual destiny, is hidden in dark mystery, which it would be impossible to pierce the presumptu or be presumptuous to even question. For the damned to complain, for their lot would be much of the same for animals to bemoan the fact they were not born as men. For everything in the flesh is separated from God by an unbridgeable gulf and deserves of him only eternal death, right? We only deserve death insofar as he has not decreed otherwise for the glorification of his majesty. We know only that a part of humanity is saved. The rest is damned. To assume that human merit or guilt play a part in determining his destiny would be to think of God's absolutely free decrees, which have been settled from eternity, as subject to change by human influence, an impossible contradiction. So I just want to pause right there. From an Orthodox standpoint, what Luther or what Calvin is getting wrong is being made in the image and our ability for free choice. You see, we have free choice. He thinks that us losing grace or having to do something would be uh, putting uh, that God's uh, determination on who is saved would, would continually change, that there, somehow there'd be change in the Godhead. And that's not the case. As Orthodox, we argue that you can lose your salvation, and that's be because you are made in the image, and you can choose that. You can choose God's will, or you cannot choose God's will. You have that ability. You have that power. That is not change in the Godhead. God doesn't change. I change. And so you see that's a sort of fundamental misunderstanding here in Calvinism. The Father 
in heaven of the New Testament, so human in understanding, who rejoices over the repentance of a sinner as a woman over the lost piece of silver she has found, is gone. Right? So Baber's highlighting that the God of Christ, the God of the New Testament, it's gone. His place has been taken by a transcendental being beyond the reach of human understanding, abstract, unknowable who with his quite incomprehensible decrees has decided the fate of every individual and regulated the tiniest details of the cosmos from eternity. God's grace is, since his decrees cannot change, as impossible for those to whom he has granted it to lose as it is attainable for those whom he has denied it. So, there is no, uh, there is no ability for you to save yourself. There is no, if you weren't chosen, sorry about you. Go kick some rocks. You're not one of the elect. Uh, you know, have fun in hell. Basically, that's all they got. <laughs> um, so an- another point that I wanted to, I'm going to skip, is the uh, the sort of rationalism. So so check check this out. There was not, there was not only no magical means of attaining the grace of God for those whom God had decided to deny, but no means whatever combined with the harsh doctrines of the absolute transcend, transcend, transcendentality, transcendentality, transcendent, yep, of God in the corruption of everything pertaining to the flesh, this inner isolation of the individual contains on the one hand, the reason for the entirely negative attitude of Puritanism to all the other sensuous and emotional elements in culture and in religion because they are of no use toward salvation and promote uh, sentimental illusions and idolatrous superstitions. Thus, it provides a basis for a fundamental antagonism to sensuous culture of all kinds, which is true. It talks about how the Protestants, uh, how, how Puritans were re, uh, repulsed by the theater, how art, again, do this idea of the worldly asceticism, your calling, that to enjoy pleasures like art, to go to the theater, to watch a play, to just enjoy and play music, this was deemed a waste of time. And therefore, if you're wasting time, you're not being virtuous, and therefore you are sinning. And so they were very antagonistic. That's what I was talking about. The worldly asceticism leads to an anti-aesthetic. They didn't like art. Um, and so... Um, continuing on here. On the other hand, it forms one of the roots of this disillusion and pessimistically inclined individualism, which can even today be identified to the national characters and the institutions of the peoples with the Puritan past. And such a striking contrast to the quite different spectacles through which the Enlightenment later looked upon men, we can clearly identify the traces of the influence of the doctrine of predestination and the elementary forms of the conduct and attitude toward life and the era in which we are concerned even where its authority as a dogma was in decline. It was, in fact, only the most extreme form of that rec- the exclusive trust in God in which we are here interested. It comes out, for instance, in the strikingly frequent repetition, especially in the English Puritan literature, of warnings against any trust in the aid of friendship of men. Even the amiable Baxter counsels deep distrust of even one's closest friend, And Bailey directly exhorts to trust no one and to say nothing compromising to anyone. Only God should be your confidant. Your confidant, I'm sorry. In striking contrast to Lutheranism, this attitude toward life was also connected with the quiet disappearance of the private confession, of which Calvin was suspicious only on account of its possible sacramental misinterpretation from all the regions of fully developed Calvinism. That was an occurrence of the greatest importance. In the first place, it is a symptom of the type of influence this religion exercised. Further, however, it was a psychological stimulus for the development of their ethical attitude, the means of a per... per, uh, 
periodical discharge, periodical discharge of the emotional sense of sin was done away with. Of the consequences for the ethical conduct of everyday life, we speak later. But for the general religious situation of a man, the consequences are evident. In spite of the necessity of membership in the church for salvation, the Calvinist intercourse with his God was carried on in deep spiritual isolation. To see the specific results of this peculiar atmosphere, it is only necessary to read Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, by far the most widely read book of all of Puritan literature. In the description of the Christian attitude after he had realized that he was living in the city of destruction and he had received the call to take up his pilgrimage to the celestial city, wife and children cling to him. But stopping his ears with his fingers and crying, Life, eternal life, he staggers forth across the fields. No refinement could surpass the naive feeling of the thinker who, writing in his prison cell, earned the applause of a believing world in expressing the emotions of the faithful Puritan, thinking only of his own salvation. This is a really important point, guys. Really important point. Because this is tied to, again, the members only video I want to make um, in regards to life is found in communion, communion, communication, and community. These are all bases in which we find life. There is no life without communication. You have to have others, right? You have to have a community. But how do you build a community? You build a community through communicating, through using the word, the word Christ, right? You use the logos to build bonds with other persons. Person to person communication is done through communication using the word. It is, it is the logos that we commune with when we take the Eucharist. That is how we build communities. And we exist in communities because that again is where life resides with the group. But what is he highlighting here with, um, Calvinism and this distrust of society, right? They do away with the confessional practice uh, within the church. And, and tied to that is a suspicion of all men. Do not trust anybody, right? What is that doing? Creating immense isolation, theologically speaking, right? It, it's, it's forcing more and more individualism, not personhood, because personhood is found in communion. It's found in communication. It's found in community. What are they pushing? Individualism, the absence, the devoidance of personhood. And so you're disconnected. Why? Because that's better than being connected because only fallible things can come from this world. You see, it's such a negative perspective on existence that it, it, it has a, you know, it won't, they, they theologically they tell you not even to build relationships with other people. That's terrible. That's terrible. And then, so then it, he highlights a, a book again, we're not going to go further into it, highlighting the journey of a Puritan man. And if, if you read further, he highlights that, you know, his wife and his children were clinging to him and that it, he put his fingers in his ears and said, life, eternal life. Find out the man fleed his, his wife and children. That it wasn't until he fled the city of destruction that he finally came to a point of stopping, no longer moving, that he realized, man, I wish my family was here. And that's what he's trying to highlight. You see, theologically speaking, Calvinism, due to the doctrine of predestination, puts so much emphasis on the individual and their own salvation that that is all they are concerned with. And that that encapsulates so much of their theology and so much of their life. Um, so I think that's a really interesting insight, right? That what that does. And so look at COVID-19, look at the pandemic. Um, do we see further isolation? And I, and, you know, that's what is so interesting to me. The, the fulfillment of one's duty, you know, um, the whole idea of essential workers, Right, you're essential to society. Uh, what well, you, you're a drive-through at McDonald's? Yeah, yeah. You're you're essential. You're an essential worker. And we see the fallenness of placing the meaning of your life in the world, 
And it is ultimately a disconnection because the world is broken. And so it's so it's so ironic that they're putting the call, right? The worldly asceticism, all this movement is going into the world. Yet at the same time, their theology is telling you the world is so fallen. Don't trust any other person. Don't ever confess your sins to another man. Only confess to God. Very, very interesting. Okay, moving on. Now we're on 109, if you guys have the book and are following. <clears throat> For us, the decisive problem is, how is this doctrine born in an age to which the afterlife was not only more important, but in many ways also more certain than any than all the interests of life in this world. The question, am I one of the elect, must sooner or later have arisen for every believer and have forced all other interests into the background. How can I be sure of this state of grace? For Calvin himself, this was not a problem. He felt himself to be a chosen agent of the Lord and was certain of his own salvation. Accordingly, to the question of how the individual can be certain of his own election, he has at bottom only the answer that we should be content with the knowledge that God has chosen and depend further only on that implicit trust in Christ, which is the result of true faith. He rejects the principle, the assumption that one can learn from the conduct of others whether they are chosen or damned. It is an unjustifiable attempt to force God's secrets. The elect differ externally in this life and no way from the damned. And even all the subjective experiences of the chosen are as possible for the damned with the single exception of that, uh, it's a it's German word, finaliter, F-I-N-A-L-I-T-E-R, that finaliter expectant, trusting faith. The elect thus are and remain God's visible church. Quite naturally, this attitude was impossible for his followers as early as Beza, and, above all, for the broad mass of ordinary men. For them, the certudio salutis, in the sense of the recognizability of the state of grace, necessarily became an absolutely dominant importance. So wherever the doctrine of predestination was held, the question could not be suppressed whether there were any infallible criteria by which membership of the elect could be known. Not only has this question continually had a central importance in the development of the pietism, which first arose on the basis of reformed church, it has in fact, in a certain sense, at times been fundamental to it. But when we consider the great political and social importance of the reformed doctrine and practice of the communion, we shall see how great a part has played during the whole 17th century outside of pietism by the possibility of ascertaining the state of grace of the individual. On it depended, for instance, his admission to communion, i.e. to the central religious ceremony which determined the social standing of the participants. It was impossible at least so far as the question of a man's own state of grace arose, to be satisfied with Calvin's trust in the testimony of the expectant faith resulting from grace. Even though the Orthodox doctrine had never formally abandoned this criterion, above all, practical pastoral work, was, which had immediately to deal with all the suffering caused by the doctrine, could not be satisfied. It met these difficulties in, ver in, uh, in various ways. So far as predestination was reinterpreted, toned down, or just fundamentally abandoned, two principal, mutually connected types of pastoral advice appear. On the one hand, it is held to be an absolute duty to consider oneself chosen and to combat all doubts of, as temptations from the devil, since lack of self-confidence is the result of insufficient faith and hence a negation of perfect grace. The exhortation of the apostle to make fast one's own call is here interpreted as a duty to attain certainty of one's own election and justification in the daily struggle of life. In the place of the humble sinners to whom Luther promises grace if they trust themselves to God in penitent faith and bread those 
self-confident saints whom we can rediscover in the hard Puritan merchants of the heroic age of capitalism and his isolated instances down to the present. I love that, that the, the, the heroes of Protestantism are, are merchants. I thought that was hilarious. I mean, what another subtle jab, but a little bit of truth to it. I mean, just look at major Protestant churches and you see the mega churches, you see the commodification of Christianity, you see you see the spirit of capitalism more dominant than Christianity in those churches. On the other hand, in order to attain that self-confidence, intense worldly activity is recommended as the most suitable means. It and it alone disperses religious doubts and gives the certainty of grace. What was just said? That was huge, guys. Huge to the thesis. So on one hand, on one hand, it is held to be an absolute duty to consider oneself chosen. Because if you don't consider yourself chosen, that's a sign of insufficient faith. But how do you show that you have sufficient faith? How do you show that? In order to attain that self-confidence, intense worldly activity is recommended as the most suitable means. It and it alone disperses religious doubts and gives the certainty of grace. I love that. Um, I have a few quotes here that I'll read. The Calvinists also wanted to be saved sola fide. But since Calvin viewed all pure feelings and emotions, no matter how exalted they might seem to be, with suspicion, faith had to be proved by its objective results in order to provide a firm foundation for uh, your basically your certitude of faith. It's another, it's a Latin word. Uh, certudo salutis. It must be a fides efficax, E-F-F-I-C-A-X, I don't know. The call to salvation, an effectual calling, expression used in the Savoy Declaration. So I love that. Think about that. So Calvinism believes in sola fide, faith alone. But because Calvin is so resistant to any sort of... Um, emotional standpoint or perspective as being very suspicious of that, not even faith alone is sufficient, right? So not even the soul is work in Calvinism. Here's another quote I have. Only one of the elect really has the, again, this type of faith that he was talking about, the fides efficax. Only he is able by virtue of his rebirth, and the resulting sanctification of his whole life to augment the glory of God by real and not merely apparent good works. It is through this consciousness that his conduct, at least in the fundamental character of constant ideal, rested on a power within himself, working for the glory of God, that it is not only willed of God, but rather done by God, that he attain the highest good towards which his religion strove, the certainty of salvation. That it was attainable was proved by Second Corinthians. Thus, however, a useless good works... Uh, Thus, however useless good works might be as a means of attaining salvation, for even the elect remain beings of the flesh, and everything they do falls infinitely short of divine standards. Nevertheless, they are indispensable as a sign of election. They are the technical means, not of purchasing salvation, but of getting rid of the fear of damnation. In this sense, they are occasionally referred to as directly necessary for salvation or the possessio salutis is made conditional to them. Um, okay, now moving on. This one is really good because it's talking about the economic rationalism. Uh, again, that's present within Calvinism, uh, Protestantism generally, the rationalism of the world, the elimination of magic as a means of, to salvation. The Catholics had not carried nearly so far as the Puritans and before them, the Jews had done to the Catholic. 
The absolution of his church was a compensation for his own imperfection. The priest was a magician who performed the miracle of transubstantiation and who held the key to eternal life in his hand. One could turn to him in grief and penitence. He dispensed atonement, hope of grace, certainty of forgiveness, and thereby granted release from the tremendous tension to which the Calvinist was doomed by an inexorable fate, admitting to no mitigation. For him, such friendly and human comforts did not exist. He could not hope to atone for hours of weakness or thoughtlessness by increased goodwill or other at other times, as the Catholic or even the Lutheran could. The God of Calvinism demanded of his believers not single good works, but a life of good works combined into a unified system. There was no place for the very human Catholic cycle of sin, repentance, atonement, release, followed by renewed sin. Nor was there any balance of merit for a life as a whole which could be adjusted by temporal punishments or the church's means of grace. The moral conduct of the average man was thus deprived of its planless and unsystematic character and subjected to a consistent method of conduct as a whole. It is no accident that the name Methodists struck to the participants in the last great revival of Puritan ideas in the 18th century, just as the term precisions, which has the same meaning, was applied to their spiritual ancestors of the 17th century. For only by a fundamental change in the whole meaning of life at every moment and in every action could the effects of grace transforming a man from the status nature to the status grace be proved. The life of the saint was directed solely toward a transcendental end, salvation. But precisely for that reason, it was thoroughly rationalized in this world and dominated entirely by the aim to add to the glory of God on earth. Never has the precept Amenia in Majorum Diem Gloriam been taken to a more bitter seriousness. Only a life guided by constant thought could achieve conquest over the state of nature. Descartes' Cogito Ergo Sum was taken over by the contemporary Puritans with this ethical reinterpretation. It was this rationalization which gave the Reformed faith its peculiar ascetic tendency and is the basis both for its relationship to and its conflict with Catholicism. For naturally, similar things were not known to Catholics. Okay. Um, here's, a, here's a real good one that I like, this section. Highlighted to me, again, the, the, the pharisaical spirit, right? We talked about this earlier, the pharisaical spirit. And um, he, just listen to this section. I think you guys will like this. It's really, really interesting. But the most important thing was the fact that the man who par excellence lived a rational life in the religious sense was and remained alone the monk. Thus, asceticism, the more strongly it gripped an individual, simply served to drive him further away from everyday life. But the holiest task was definitely to surpass all worldly morality. Luther, who was not in any sense fulfilling any law of development, but acting upon his quite personal experience, which was, though at first somewhat uncertain, in its practical consequences, later pushed farther by the political situation, had repudiated the tendency and Calvinism simply took this over from him. Sebastian Franck struck the central characteristic of this type of religion when he saw the significance of the Reformation in the fact that now every Christian had to be a monk all his life. The drain of asceticism from everyday worldly life had been stopped by a dam. And those passionately spiritual natures which had formerly supplied the highest type of monk were now forced to pursue their ascetic ideals within mundane occupations. But in the course of its development, Calvinism added something positive to this. The idea of the necessity of proving one's faith in worldly activity. Therein it gave the broader groups 
of religiously inclined people a positive incentive to asceticism. By founding its ethic in the doctrine of predestination, it substituted for the spiritual aristocracy of monks outside of and above the world the spiritual aristocracy of the predestined saints of God within the world. I love that, right? Do you see what, that, what you see what he just did? He was talking about how Calvinism moved the really the the um, he calls it the aristocracy, right, of the saints within Orthodoxy, Catholicism, of their unworldliness, unworld right, their more divinity. He contrasts that with Calvinism and its elected being entirely worldly, not transcendent. I love that. It was an aristocracy which, with its uh, character indelibless, was derived from the eternally damned reminder of humanity by a more impossible and in its invisibility more terrifying gulf, then separated the monk of the Middle Ages from the rest of the world about him, a gulf which penetrated all social relations with its sharp brutality. This consciousness of divine grace of the elect and holy was accompanied by an attitude toward the sin of another's neighbor, not a sympathetic understanding based on consciousness's own weakness, but of hatred and contempt for him as an enemy of God bearing the signs of eternal damnation. This sort of feeling was capable of such intensity that it sometimes resulted in the formation of sex. I, I loved I loved when it was talking about this consciousness, not seeing one's own weakness, but almost despising their neighbors, hating them. I couldn't help but see the sort of ethos of the social justice warrior there, right? This sort of feeling was capable of such intensity that it sometimes resulted in the formation of sex. This was the case when, as in the independent movement of the 17th century, the genuine Calvinist doctrine that the glory of God required the church to bring the damned under the law was outweighed by the conviction that it was an insult to God. And if, if uh, it was an insult to God, if an unregenerate soul should be admitted to his house and partake of the sacraments or even as a minister administer them. Thus, as a consequence of the doctrine of proof, the Donatist idea of the church appeared as in the case of the Calvinistic Baptists, the full logical consequence of the demand for a pure church, a community of those proved to be in a great state of grace, was not often drawn by forming sex. Modifications in the constitution of the church resulted from the attempt to separate, regenerate, and unregenerate Christians, those who were from those who were not prepared for the sacrament to keep the government of the church or some privilege in the hands of the former and only ordain ministers of whom there was no question. So I really enjoyed that highlighting that pharisaical spirit, right? They got so caught up in their worldliness. They got so caught up in their electedness that they didn't even want an unregenerate person in the church. We need a pure church. I thought the church was a hospital. I thought the church was a place in which the sick come. I thought the, the body of Christ is to heal the weak, the feeble, the dying. I thought that was the point. No, you see in the Calvinist doctrine, a pharisaical spirit, a purification, if you will. Okay, so yada, 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 uh, moving forward, this or that. He talks about pietism. Um, and, and so here's a little section on German pietism. I have a brief section on Methodism. And then I uh, really just want to flip to uh, the capitalist section. Now we'll just be talking about economics, economics, really. So here's a really interesting section where he's, he's connecting pietism to the worldly asceticism of Calvinism. So he's looking at the pietistic movement and he's making connections with the predestination, the worldliness, the calling, the secular calling, all these ideas. Now he's connecting it with the pietistic movement. All in all, when we consider German pietism from the point of view important for us, we must admit a vacillation and uncertainty in the religious basis of its asceticism, which makes it definitely weaker than the I'm sorry, than the iron consistency of Calvinism, which is partly the result of Lutheran influences and partly of its emotional character. <clears throat> 
To be sure, it is very one-sided to make this emotional element the distinguishing characteristic of pietism as opposed to Lutheranism. But compared to Calvinism, the rationalization of life was necessarily less intense because the pressure of occupation with a state of grace, which had continually to be proved, and which was concerned for the future in eternity, was diverted to the present emotional state. The place of of the self-confidence which the elect sought to attain and continually to renew and restless and successful work at his calling was taken by an attitude of humility and abnegation. This in turn was partly the result of emotional stimulus directed solely toward spiritual experience, partly of the Lutheran institution of the confession, which though it was often looked upon with serious doubts by pietism was still generally tolerated. All this shows the influence of the peculiarly Lutheran conception of salvation by the forgiveness of sins and not by practical sanctification, in place of the systematic rational structure to attain and retain certain knowledge of future salvation comes here the need to feel reconciliation and community with God now. Thus, the tendency of the, pu- of the pursuit of present enjoyment to hinder the rational organization of economic life, depending as it does on provision for the future, has in a certain sense a parallel in the field of the religious life. Evidently, then, the orientation of religious needs to present emotional satisfaction could not only develop so powerful a motive to rationalize worldly activity as the need of the Calvinistic elect for proof with their exclusive preoccupation with the beyond. On the other hand, it was considerably more favorable to the method... to the methodical penetration of conduct with religion than the traditionalistic faith of the Orthodox Lutheran, bound as it was to the word, the logos, it's capitalized, and the sacraments. On the whole, pietism from Frank to Spencer to Zizendorf tended towards increasing emphasis on the emotional side. But this was not in any sense the expression of an imminent law of development. The differences resulted from differences of the religious and social environments from which the leaders came. We cannot enter into that here nor discuss the the peculiarities of German pietism have affected its social and geographical extension. We must again remind ourselves that this emotional pietism, of course, shades off into the way of life of the Puritan elect by quite gradual stages. If we can, at least provisionally, point out any practical consequence of the difference, we may say that the virtues favored by pietism were more those on the one hand of the faithful official, the clerk, the laborer, or the domestic worker, and on the other hand, of the predominantly patriarchal employer with a pious condescension. Calvinism, in comparison, appears to be more closely related to the hard legalism and the active enterprise of bourgeoisie capitalistic entrepreneurs. Finally, the purely emotional form of pietism is, as Ritschel has pointed out, a religious... uh, dilentantism I don't know what that word means for the leisure classes however for this characterization falls short of being exhaustive it helps to explain certain differences in the character including the economic character of peoples who have been under the influence of one or the other of these two ascetic movements the pietistic movement and the pre-destinational Calvinistic movement so that's what he had to say about pietism. And I got another quick section here on the Methodists. And then we'll be hopping into a uh, discussion on capitalism directly. We'll be getting more into the economic side of this. So, um, Uh, The combination of an emotional but still ascetic type of religion with increasing indifference to or repudiation of the dogmatic basis of Calvinistic asceticism is characteristic also of the Anglo-American movement corresponding to the continental pietism, namely Methodism. The name in itself shows the impressed 
contemporaries as characteristic of its adherence, the methodical, systematic nature of conduct for the purpose of attaining a certitu salutis, this was form uh, this was from the beginning the center of religious aspiration for this movement also and remains so in spite of all the differences the undoubted relationship to certain branches of german pietism is shown above all by the fact the method was used primarily to bring about the emotional act of conversion and the emphasis on feeling in John Wesley, awakened by Moravian and Lutheran influence, led Methodism from the beginning, saw its mission among the masses to take on a strongly emotional character, especially in America. The attainment of repentance under certain circumstances involved an emotional struggle of such intensity as it led to the most terrible ecstasies, which in America often took place in a public meeting. <laughs> This formed the basis of a belief in the undeserved possession of divine grace and at the same time an immediate consciousness of justification and forgiveness. Now this emotional religion entered in a peculiar alliance containing no small inherent difficulties with the ascetic ethics which had for good and all been stamped out rationally by Puritanism. For one thing, unlike Calvinism, which had everything emotional to be illusory, the only sure basis for the certitude salutis was in principle held to be the pure feeling of absolute certainty of forgiveness derived immediately from the testimony of the Spirit, the coming of which could be definitely placed to the hour. Added to this is Wesley's doctrine of sanctification, which we should hide. Wesley's doctrine of sanctification, mind you, actually comes uh, from his reading of St. Macarius the Great, and he was very much interested in Orthodox understanding of theosis. So I think that is very interesting that uh, Wesley gets his sanctification from the theosis doctrine in Orthodoxy. According to it, one reborn in this manner can, by virtue of the divine grace already working in him, even in this life, attain sanctification, the consciousness of perfection in the sense of freedom from sin by a second, generally separate, often sudden spiritual transformation. However difficult of attainment this end is, generally not till toward the end of one's life, it must inevitably be sought because it finally guarantees the certitude salutis and substitutes the serene confidence for the sullen worry of the Calvinist, and it distinguishes the true convert in his own eyes and those of others by the fact that sin, at least, no longer has power over him. Okay, so now we've laid out the whole basis of the theology, of how these things are related now we're going to get into the asceticism and capitalism so um <clears throat> so we are now getting into chapter five asceticism in the spirit of capitalism for the purpose of this chapter though by no means for all purposes we can treat ascetic protestantism as a single whole but since that side of english puritanism which was derived from Calvinism, gives the most consistent religious basis for the idea of the calling, we shall, following our previous method, place one of the representatives at the center of our discussion. Richard Baxter stands out above many other writers on Puritan ethics, both because of his eminently practical and realistic attitude and at the same time because of the universal recognition accorded to his works, which have gone through many new editions and translations. He was a Presbyterian and an apologist of the Westminster Synod, but at the same time, like so many of the best spirits of his time, gradually grew away from the dogmas of pure Calvinism. Now, in glancing at Baxter's Saints Everlasting Rest or his Christian Directory, a similar work, a similar works of others, one is struck at first glance by the emphasis placed in the discussion of wealth and its acquisition on the Ibionotic elements of the New Testament. Wealth, as such, is a great danger. Its temptations never end, and its pursuit is not only senseless as compared with the dominating importance of the kingdom of God, but is morally suspect. 
Here, asceticism seems to have turned much more sharply against the acquisition of earthly goods than it did in Calvin, who saw no hindrance to the effectiveness of the clergy and their wealth, but rather a thoroughly desirable enhancement of their prestige. Hence, he, per he permitted them to employ their means profitably. Examples of the condemnation of the pursuit of money and goods may be gathered without end from Puritan writings and may be contrasted with late medieval ethical literature, which was more, was much more open-minded on this point. Moreover, these doubts were meant to perfect, were meant with perfect seriousness. Only it is necessary to examine them somewhat more closely in order to understand their true ethical significance and implications. The real moral objection is to relaxation in the security of possessions and the enjoyment of wealth with the consequences of idleness and the temptations of the flesh above all distraction from the pursuit of righteous life. In fact, it is only because possession involves this danger of relaxation that it is objectionable at all. For the saints, everlasting rest is in the next world. On earth, man must, to, certain to be certain of his state of grace, quote, do the works of him who sent him as long as it is yet day, unquote. Not leisure and enjoyment, but only activity serves to increase the glory of God according to the definite manifestations of his will. Waste of time is thus the first and in principle the deadliest of Protestant sins. The span of human life is infinitely short and precious to make sure of one's own election. Loss of time through sociability, idle talk, luxuries, even more sleep than is necessary for health, only six to eight hours, is worthy of absolute moral condemnation. It does not yet hold with Franklin that time is money, but the proposition is true in a certain spiritual sense. It is infinitely valuable because every hour lost to labor is lost for the glory of God. Thus, inactive contemplation is also valueless and even directly reprehensible if it is at the expense of one's daily work. For it is less pleasing to God than active performance of his will in a calling. Besides, Sunday is provided for that, and, according to Baxter, it is always those who are not diligent in their callings who have no time for God when the occasion demands it. Accordingly, Baxter's principal work is dominated by the continually repeated, often almost passionate preaching of hard, continuous bodily or mental labor. It is due to a combination of two different motives. Labor is, on the one hand, an approved ascetic technique, as it is always has been in the Western Church, in sharp contrast not only to the Orient, I think he's meaning the Orthodox, but to almost all monastic rules all over the world. It is in particular, it is in particular the specific defense against all those temptations which Puritanism united under the name of unclean life, whose role for it was by no means small. The sexual asceticism of Puritanism differs only in degree, not in fundamental principle, from that of monasticism. And on account of that Puritan conception of marriage, its practical influence is far more reaching than that of the letter, than that of the latter, I'm sorry. For sexual intercourse is permitted, even within marriage, only as the means willed by God for the increase of his glory, according to the commandment, be fruitful and multiply, along with a moderate vegetable, uh, vegetable diet and cold baths. The same prescription is given for all sexual temptations as is issued against religious doubts and a sense of moral unworthiness. Quote, work hard in your calling, unquote. So that, that is their, that is the teaching, um, Right, you're temptuous. You're uncertain. You don't know what to do. You're you're being pulled. What what is the Protestant uh, mantra? Work hard in your calling. But the most important thing was that even beyond that labor came to be considered in itself the end of life, ordained as such by God. Saint Paul's quote: He 
who will not work shall not eat, unquote, holds unconditionally for everyone. Unwillingness to work is symptomatic of the lack of grace. <clears throat> the phenomenon of the division of labor in the occupations in society had, among others, been interpreted by Thomas Aquinas, to whom we may most conveniently refer as a direct consequence of the divine scheme of things. But the places assigned to each man in this cosmos follow uh, ex causis naturalibus and are fortuitous, contingent in the scholastic terminology. The differentiation of men into the classes and occupations established through historical development became, for Luther, as we have seen, a direct result of the divine will. The perseverance of the individual in the place and within the limits which God had assigned to him was a religious duty. This was the more certainly the consequence since the relations of Lutheranism to the world were in general uncertain from the beginning and remain so. Ethical principles for the reform in the world could not be found in Luther's realm of ideas. In fact, it never quite freed itself from Pauline indifference. Hence, the world had to be accepted as it was, and this alone could be made religious duty. But the Puritan view, the providential character of the play of private economic interest takes on a somewhat different emphasis. True to the Puritan tendency <clears throat> to pragmatic interpretations, the providential purpose of the division of labor is to be known by its fruits. On this point, Baxter expresses himself in terms which more than once directly called Adam Smith's well-known apotheosis of the division of labor. The specialization of occupation leads, since it makes the development of skill possible, to a quantitative and qualitative improvement in production and thus serves the common good, which is identical with the good of which greatest possible number, utilitarianism. So far, the motivation is purely utilitarian and is so closely related to customary viewpoint of much of secular literature of the time. A man without a calling thus lacks the systematic, methodical character which is, as we have seen, demanded by worldly asceticism. What, God's, what God demands is not labor in itself, but rational labor in a calling. And the Puritan concept of the calling, the emphasis is always placed on the methodical character of worldly asceticism, not, as with Luther, on the acceptance of the lot which God has ir uh, irretrievably assigned to man. Um, the, uh, let's see here. Okay, so, all right, we still got a few of you guys still here. Um, hope everyone is doing well. Uh, please smash that like if you guys haven't. I know I've been reading quite a bit. Most people don't like the reading. It takes a little bit more concentration, I know, than me just ranting and raving. But at least we got 29 nerds that are interested. <laughs> so I got a paragraph here, and then I'm going to hit you basically... Uh, with, well, I got another actually good paragraph. I got a few good paragraphs. Then I'm going to hit you with the conclusion of the book and then we'll wrap it up and we'll look at, uh, some super chats. So anybody who threw in, threw in some super chats, I will be checking those out, uh, here in a minute. So, um, so we will be dealing with those here in one minute. Um, Okay, so check this. I really enjoyed this paragraph right here. The, the note I made next to it is the pharisaical spirit, another, another incidence of that. So check it out. But the more emphasis was placed on those parts of the Old Testament which praise formal legality as a sign of conduct pleasing to God. They held the theory that the Mosaic law had only lost its validity through Christ insofar as it contained ceremonial or purely historical precepts applying only to the Jewish people. 
but that otherwise it had always been valid as an expression of the natural law and must hence be retained. This made it possible, on the one hand, to eliminate elements which could not be reconciled with modern life. But still, through its numerous related features, Old Testament morality was able to give a powerful impetus to the spirit of self-righteous and sober legality, which is so characteristic of the worldly asceticism of Protestantism. I thought that was so true. So true. Um... <laughs> Um, oh, well, Ma Pano, Jimmy, Tom Henderson still here. Oh, we still got the crew. Simon, the amputee. Heck yeah. All right. All the important people are still here. So uh, I liked, I really liked that paragraph. Uh, check this one out. I, I, the note that I put next to this one was the worldly ascetic spirit is anti-aesthetic or the worldly ascetic is anti-aesthetic. The worldly ascetic is anti-aesthetic. So check it out. The theater was obnoxious to the Puritans. And with the strict exclusion of the erotic and of nudity from the realm of toleration, a radical view of either literature or art could not exist. The conception of idle talk, of superfluities, and of vain ostination all designations of an irrational attitude without objective purpose, thus not ascetic, and especially not serving the glory of God, but of man, were always at hand to serve in deciding in favor of sober utility as against any artistic tendency. This was especially true in the case of decoration of the person. For instance, clothing. That powerful tendency towards uniformity of life, which today so immensely aids the capitalistic interest and the standardization of production, had its ideal foundations in the repudiation of all idolatry of the flesh. Of course, we must not forget that Puritanism included a world of contradictions and that the instinctive sense of eternal greatness in art was certainly stronger among its leaders than in the atmosphere of the Cavaliers. Moreover, a unique genius like Rembrandt, however little his conduct may have been acceptable to God in the eyes of Puritans, was very strongly influenced in the character of his work by the religious environment. But that does not alter the picture as a whole, insofar as the development of the Puritan tradition could not, in part, and in part did, lead to a powerful spiritualization of personality. It was a decided benefit to literature. But for the most part, that benefit only accrued to later generations. I love that. So the Puritan tradition, what did it do in its... In its um, in its rejection of um, what what did the Puritans do in, the, in its rejection of the aesthetic of the, if, if its rejection of the art, it created a powerful spiritualization of the personality. And so, what did I write down? The cult of personality, Protestant megachurches, right? Because that's what they are. You get these Protestant megachurches, and they really are. A cult of a personality. That's what it is. If that preacher, if that minister left, that church is going to fall apart. You know, and that's not the body of Christ. That's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ doesn't move away. It doesn't die when the priest leaves. It doesn't die when the bishop dies. It certainly doesn't go away when the minister dies. But in Protestantism, given this 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 aura, this powerful spiritualization of the personality. Wow. Is that not insightful? Is that not insightful? It's like, wow. <clears throat> so I, I really, I really love that. Now I want to hit you guys basically with the conclusion of Weber's argument. So okay, warn you, I'll be going for probably about seven pages, but this, uh, is going to wrap up his whole argument. So this is going to wrap up the asceticism and the spirit of capitalism. We're going to be reading from page 176 to the end of the book. And then we'll get into super chats. Um, I see Simon, the amputee 
just super chatted on on YouTube. Thank you very, very much, brother. I promise I will get to that. And anybody who has super chatted over on Streamlabs, I will be getting that getting to that just a minute. Just I'm just gonna finish this book, right? Okay. So I probably need I probably need a sip of water here. I've been reading for over two hours. Okay. So here we go. This is from 176 to the end. This is the conclusion of Max Weber's The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. <clears throat> As Wesley, John Wesley, founder of Methodism, or, you know, uh, accredited founder of Methodism. As Wesley here says, the full economic effect of those great religious movements whose significance for economic development lay above all in their ascetic educative influence generally came only after the peak of the purely religious enthusiasm was passed. Then the intensity of the search for the kingdom of God commenced gradually to pass over into sober economic virtue. The religious roots died out slowly, giving away to utilitarian worldliness. Then, as Dowden puts it, as in Robinson Crusoe, the isolated economic man who carries on missionary activities on the side takes the place of the lonely spiritual search for the kingdom of heaven of Bunyan's pilgrim, hurrying through the marketplace of vanity. When, later, the principle, quote, to make the most of both worlds, unquote, became dominant in the end, as Dowden has remarked, a good conscience simply became one of the means of enjoying a comfortable bourgeoisie lifestyle, as is well expressed in the German proverb about the soft pillow. What the great religious epoch of the 17th century bequeathed is its utilitarian successor. Oh, okay, what the century bequeathed to its utilitarian successor was, however, above all an amazingly good, we may even say a pharisaically good, conscience and the acquisition of money, so long as it took place legally. Every trace of the de placer vix protest was disappeared. I'm not even sure what that means, sorry. A specifically bourgeoisie economic ethic had grown up with the consciousness of standing in the fullness of God's grace and being visibly blessed by Him, uh, prosperity gospel, the bourgeoisie businessman, as long as he remained within the bounds of formal correctness, as long as his moral conduct was spotless and the use to which he put his wealth was not objectionable, could follow his uh, pecuniary interest as he would and feel that he was fulfilling a duty in doing so. The power of religious asceticism provided him, in addition, with sober, conscientious, and gradually industrious workmen who clung to their work as to a life purpose willed by God. Finally, it gave him the comforting assurance that the unequal distribution of the goods of this world was a special dispensation of divine providence, which, in these differences, as in peculiar grace, pursued secret ends unknown to men. Calvin himself had made the much quoted statement that only when the people, i.e. the mass of laborers and craftsmen, were poor did they remain obedient to God. In the Netherlands, that had been secularized to the effect that the mass of men only labor when the necessity forces them to do so. This formulation of a leading idea of capitalistic economy later entered into the current theories of the productivity of low ages. Here also, with the dying out of the religious root, the utilitarian interpretation crept in unnoticed in the line of development, which we have again and again observed. Medieval ethics not only tolerated begging, but, all, but actually glorified it in the mendicant orders. Even secular beggars, since they gave the persons of means opportunity for good works through giving alms, were sometimes considered in a state and treated as such. Even the Anglican social ethic of the Stuarts was very close to this attitude. It remained for Puritan asceticism to take part in the severe English poor relief legislation, which fundamentally changed the situation. And it could do that because the Protestant sects and the strict Puritan communities actually did not know any begging in their midst. On the other hand, seen from the side of the workers, 
The Zinzendorf branch of pietism, for instance, glorified the loyal worker who did not seek acquisition, but lived according to the apostolic model and was thus endowed with the charisma of the disciples. Similar ideas had originally been prevalent among the Baptists in an even more radical form. Now, naturally, the whole ascetic literature of almost all denominations is saturated with the idea of faithful labor, even at low wages, on the part of those whom life offers no other opportunities, is highly pleasing to God. In this respect, Protestant asceticism added in itself nothing new, but it did not only depend this, it, but it, but it not only depended this idea most powerfully. It also created the force which was also decisive for its effectiveness. The psychological sanction of it through the conception of this labor as a calling, as the best, often in the last analysis, the only means of attaining certainty of grace. And on the other hand, it legalized the exploration of this specific willingness to work in that it also interpreted the employer's business activity as a calling. It is obvious how powerfully the exclusive search for the kingdom of God only through the fulfillment of duty and the calling and the strict asceticism which church discipline naturally imposed, especially on the propertyless classes, was bound to affect the productivity of labor in the capitalistic sense of the word. The treatment of labor as a calling became as characteristic of the modern worker as the corresponding attitude toward acquisition of the businessman. It was a perception of the situation, new at the time, which caused so able an observer as Sir William Petty to attribute the economic power of Holland to the 17th cent of the, in the 17th century to the fact that the very numerous dissenters in that country, Calvinists and Baptists, quote, are for the most part thinking sober men and such as believe that labor and industry is their duty towards God, unquote. Calvinism opposed organic social organization in the physical monopolistic form which it assumed in Anglicanism under the Stuarts, especially in the conceptions of Laud, this alliance of church and state with the monopolist on the basis of a Christian social ethical foundation. Its leaders were universally among the most passionate opponents of this type of politically privileged commercial putting out in colonial capitalism. Over against it, they placed the individualistic motives of rational legal acquisition by virtue of one's own ability and initiative. And while the politically privileged monopoly industries in England all disappeared in short order, this attitude played a large and decisive part in the development of the industries which grew up in spite of and against the authority of the state. The Puritans repudiated all connection with the large-scale capitalistic courtiers and projectors as an ethically suspicious class. On the other hand, they took pride in their own superior middle-class business morality, which formed the true reason for the persecutions to which they were subjected on the part of those circles. Defoe proposed to win the battle against dissent by boycotting bank credit and withdrawing deposits. The difference of the two types of capitalistic attitude went to very large extent hand in hand with religious differences. The opponents of the nonconformists, even in the 18th century, again and again ridiculed them for personifying the spirit of shopkeepers and for having ruined the ideals of old England. Here also lay the difference of the Puritan economic ethic from the Jewish. The contemporaries knew all that the former and not the latter was the bourgeoisie capitalistic ethic. One of the fundamental elements of the spirit of modern capitalism, and not only of that but of all modern culture, rational conduct on the basis of the idea of the calling was born. That is what this discussion has sought to demonstrate from the spirit of Christian asceticism. One has only to reread the passage from Franklin quoted at the beginning of this essay in order to see that the essential elements of the attitude which was there called the spirit of capitalism are the same as what we have just shown to be 
to be the content of the Puritan worldly asceticism, only without the religious basis, which by Franklin's time had already died away. The idea that modern labor has an ascetic character is, of course, not new. Limitation to specialized work with a renunciation to the Faustian universality of man which it involves is a condition any valuable work in the modern world. Hence, deeds and renunciation inevitably condition each other today. This fundamentally ascetic trait of middle-class life, if it attempts to be a way of life at all, and not simply the absence of any, was what Goeth wanted to teach at the height of his wisdom in the, this is a German word, Wanderhauern, and in the end which he gave to the life of his Faust. For him, the realization meant a renunciation, a departure from an age of full and beautiful humanity, which can no more be repeated in the course of our cultural development than can the flower of the Athenian culture of antiquity. The Puritan wanted to work in a calling. We are forced to do so. For when asceticism was carried out of monastic cells into everyday life and began to dominate worldly morality, it did its part in building the tremendous cosmos of the modern economic order. This order is now bound to the technical and the economic conditions of machine production, which today determine the lives of all the individuals who were born into this mechanism, not only those directly concerned with economic acquisition, with irresistible force. Perhaps it will be so determine them, it will be so determine them until the last ton of fossilized coal is burnt. In Baxter's view, the care for external goods should only lie on the shoulders of the saint like a light cloak, which can be thrown aside at any moment. But fate decreed that cloak should become an iron cage. Since asceticism undertook the undertook to remodel the world and to work out its ideals in the world, material goods have gained an increasing and finally an ex, an ex, uh, inexorable power over the lives of men as at no previous period in history. Today, the spirit of religious asceticism, whether finally, who knows, has escaped from the cage but victorious capitalism, since it rests on mechanical foundation, needs its support no longer. The rosy blush of its laughter, laughing air, the enlightenment, seems also to be irretrievably fading, and the idea of duty in one's calling prowls about in our lives like the ghost of dead religious beliefs. Where the fulfillment of the calling cannot directly be related to the highest spiritual and cultural values, or when, on the other hand, it need not be felt simply as economic compulsion, the individual generally abandons the attempt to justify it at all. In the fields of its highest development in the United States, the pursuit of wealth stripped of its religious and ethical meaning tends to become associated with purely mundane passions, which often actually give it the character of sport. I, I just want to pause there. I have a few more paragraphs. Is that not insightful? Guys, It's ta he's talking about the United States at the end of the 19th century, the end of the 1800s. He's, he's looking and seeing all this stuff. Now, I think the Protest this book was written in, uh, uh, it, it was published in 1905. This book was published in 1905. And so he's talking, and so the United States, the pursuit of wealth stripped of its religious and ethical meaning tends to become associated with purely mundane passions. That's what we export to the world, right? Is, is to people to be attached to their passions. The LGBTQ, the capitalism, the consumerism, all the commodities, right? The MTV, the Hollywood, the sex, the pornography. That's what America exports is passions. Which often actually give it the character of sport, and that's exactly what it is. You hear everybody defending free market. I'm a conservative. I, free markets. That the acquisition of wealth, the acquisition of things, is now a sport in society, and it's even imbued with uh, with virtue, with 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 callings of duty. And so him highlighting the theological origins of, I, of these ideas, though now the theology has washed away, those ideas are still present 
very much present in our society, even in their secular ideas, because at root, they are secular ideas, right? So that I think is really, really interesting. Okay. I got three more paragraphs and we're done. No one knows who will live in this cage in the future or whether at the end of this tremendous development, entirely new prophets will arise or there will be a great rebirth of old ideas and ideals, or if neither mechanized petrification embellished with a sort of convulsive self-importance. For of the last stage of this cultural development, it might be well, it might, it might well be truly said, specialist without spirit, sensualist without heart. This nullity imagines that it has attained a level of civilization never before reached. But this brings us to the world of judgments of value and of faith with which it, which with, with which this purely historical discussion need not be burdened. The next task would rather to show the significance of ascetic rationalism, which has only been touched on the foregoing sketch for the content of practical social ethics. Thus, for the types of organization and the functions of social groups from the conventicle of the state, then its relations to the humanistic rationalism, its ideals of life and cultural influence, further to the development of philosophical and scientific empiricism, to technical development and to spiritual ideals would have to be analyzed. Then its historical development from the medieval beginnings of worldly asceticism to its dissolution into pure utilitarianism would have to be traced out through all the areas of ascetic religion. Only then could the quantitative, quali uh, quantitative cultural significance of ascetic Protest Protestantism in its relation to other plastic elements of modern culture be estimated. Here we have only attempted to trace the fact and the direction of its influence to their motives in one, though very important point. But it would be also further be necessary to investigate how Protestant asceticism was in turn influenced by its development and its character by the totality of social conditions, especially economic. The modern man is in general, even with the best will, unable to give religious ideas a significance for culture and national character which they deserve. But it is, of course, not my aim to substitute for a one-sided materialistic or an equally-sided spiritualistic causal interpretation of culture and history. Each is equally possible, but each, if it does not serve as the preparation, but the conclusion of an investigation accomplishes equally little in the interest of historical truth. And that is the end of Max Weber's famous famous book the protestant ethic in the spirit of capitalism and so again what did we cover worldly asceticism calvin under calvinist understandings of predestination luther's conception of the call protestant pietism and the emotional quality imbued in its worship that what we, what we just read is weber argues that the worldly, so that Luther's call, the idea of a calling outside clergy, outside the church, led to people re envisioning Christians, Protestants, re envisioning God's call for their life inside of a secular world, that their job becomes their calling. So that is the first one. That then leads to a, a, a theology of asceticism. Protestantism has no monastic tradition. It has no monasteries, yet it still has very much a yearning of ascetic qualities. How does that play itself out? Asceticism and the virtue of asceticism gets displayed in one's willingness to work and to deal with the struggles of life, to be, accept their place in the world and to work hard in their calling. This becomes an ascetic virtue. And this becomes one way in which one can know their salvation. Now, why does that lead to one knowing their salvation? He's connecting that to, he's connecting that to Calvinist understanding of predestination. Calvin believed that there are elect and there's the unelect, that God from eternity before time has already chosen certain people to be elect 
they are going to go to the kingdom. Others will not. Nothing you can do about that. So then the question came from believers, how do we know that we're part of the elect? And Calvin responded that it's on them to sense that, to become confident, because if they don't, that is a sign of insufficient faith. And so men and women, particularly men, wanting to demonstrate that they have sufficient faith, one way in which Calvin can, or Calvinism recognized that is through worldly means, through success. One can demonstrate their self-confidence being one of the elect by becoming successful in the world. And so what did we just do here? We just connected predestination and an understanding of, of how we demonstrate our, our soteriology, the idea of a calling, and the idea of ascetic practices, again, tied to tied to the world. And then as we hit highlighted at the end there, new Protestant theology that, that talked about, again, given the worldly asceticism, given your calling, given the, uh, the Calvinist predestination. Then we talked about the sort of pharisaical spirit, the, the, the legalistic understanding, the framework that all that provided a basis for really Protestantism, giving a moral language, that it is your duty to go out in your calling and make money, be successful, be successful. Now you ask them, why do you do that? They say it's for my family and it's for my kids. But the same thing as he highlighted at the beginning of the book, it would be true for the Catholic or for the Orthodox in that case, who choose to rather not work, have the same amount of money and not work than to work more and make more money. And so, Protestantism gives a moral language to working more, making more money. Why? Because that's your calling. That's your duty. God wants you to work, work, work in your calling. And when you're not doing that, as we highlighted with forms of uh, Puritanism, that well, you, that idleness, that, that leisureness, that is laziness. Therefore, that is unvirtuous. Therefore, you are sinning. Therefore, you can, you can make the logical jump by not working, by not getting into the world, by not becoming more successful. You are negating your purpose, and therefore, you're not manifesting God in the world further and further and further. And so even within these ideas, we talked about the Calvinist understanding. They're, they're, it's so ironic. The, the irony is their theology becomes so worldly Yet at the same time, Calvin was telling his followers and other people, don't trust anybody, right? Don't trust another man. You can't trust humans. They're so fallible. So it created this immense isolation, this immense individualism. And so you, you see this like destruction of the community where salvation is upon you doing your duty. Don't confess to anybody else. Confess only to God, right? Right. The, the individualism just became rampant, rampant within, within this worldview. And, uh, and we see the economic rationalism tied to all this stuff, right? They, Protestantism makes rational arguments for the necessity to work in moral language. And so I love when it highlighted, Max Weber was highlighting, you know, when people were attacking the Methodists or the Quakers or the Puritans, what were they upset with? Were they upset that they were middle-class people? Were they upset with their ideas of the atonement? Were they upset with their soteriology? No, they were upset that they wouldn't stop working. And the fact that they wouldn't stop working tied to this moral language, this moral incentive to engage in the world, it created the, the whole industrial capitalistic enterprise and it only enveloped more and more people. And so whether you wanted to be in it or not, you were going to be. And so that's what Weber was highlighting. This thing grows, but it, it only needed the, the Protestantism at the beginning. It just needed some of the moral language at the beginning. And then it doesn't need it anymore. So then he talks about America. You see, but once you built, once you get the capitalistic, industrial capitalistic framework going, it doesn't need the ideology to maintain itself because it's built in machines and societal structure. 
And so the idea of virtue in your calling and working all the time, these are things that we aren't even Protestant. Well, most of us aren't Protestants, but being born in America, being born in any Protestant nation, you can f still feel that, right? To go out and work. I mean, I, I, I totally sense that in myself, right? I work all the day because I feel like if I don't, I'm wasting time. Right. And so, again, back to what what was Max Weber using to highlight the whole beginning point, like where this thing ended. He was using Ben Franklin. Time is money. That no point in history did anybody make that connection. At no point in history did somebody argue that time is equal to money because people didn't want to work all the time. And so the reason why people wanted to work tied to that Protestant ethic <laughs> that creates the sort of capitalistic environment that gets the industries going and whether those individual theologies or those individual denominations, however they felt about capital, it didn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's that the framework, the moral framework for people to pursue a life like that is already laid out. And now we live in that world, right? Why is the feminist, why is she more powerful to go get a career? It's tied in the Protestant ethic. It's virtuous. It's her calling. It's utilitarian. It contributes to society, right? Go make as much money as you can. All that stuff. We live in that world, guys. All the values that he talked about present within, present within, the, within, the, within the Protestant ethic, it, it's all in America now. It's the same thing. The social justice warriors, right? Their hatred, their, the, the demonization of their neighbor, Right? He was talking about how at points the Protestant ethic in, in this idea of the worldliness and devoting yourself and working all the time, that it, be, it, it created a sentiment in many of the elect that they looked down on their neighbors because they didn't want to work all the time. They weren't fulfilling their calling. They didn't have the strength. right? They didn't have the moral strength and fortitude to go out and work six days a week and then not on Sunday right? because we're good Christians. That those people were weak. They looked down on them. They hated them. And so then it's like, what do we see in society? You can see, I just feel like there's so many of the same sentiments. They just get mirrored. They get reversed. They get manipulated in a way. But we're, we're existing in the same milieu. And so Max Weber, again, wrote this book in 1905. It was published. So he wrote it before that, but published in 1905. How insightful was this book, for those who stayed and listened, into understanding the rise of the spirit of capitalism and the whole idea of virtuosity in regards to engaging in the capitalistic enterprise. So when you look at modern day conservatism and the neocon movement or the whole fake capitalism versus socialism, capitalism versus socialism, like that just low, low IQ conversation that is built on the Protestant ethic. The whole basis is built on utilitarianism and the idea that it's virtuous for you to pursue wealth, it's virtuous for you to follow your calling as long as you can. So um, that concludes today's video. That con I had no idea it was going to take this long, but I never do. So thank you. Thank you very much, everyone who is still here. Now I will dive into these super chats. I hope tonight's conversation was insightful. Again, happy... Um, Happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone. Um, uh, first super chat is from Simon the Amputee. Man, this text is really showing me just how much of a Protestant orientation I operate on. I know, Simon, exactly. Same for me. Same for me. My work ethic, the way that I, I totally see value in me working all the time, which is imbued in these Protestant presuppositions, right? Very interesting stuff. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Simon, for that super chat and the $5. I really, really appreciate it, brother. And I totally understand. I'm the same exact way. Deanna DS throws in four ninety nine. Thank you very, very much, Deanna. And she says, God bless this ortho community. Well, God bless you and your family and God bless this ortho community. God bless everybody. Happy Lent guys. Hope everyone's having a wonderful day. Um, so, uh, looks like Jimmy hopped back in here. Here we go. Hope he reads the message I attached to my super. Oh yeah, dude, I'm ready. 
Okay, so now let's look at the Streamlabs. We'll look at the Streamlabs Super Chats. Um, okay, first one from today. Actually, let me just read. There was one that came in last stream on the Shaman stream. It came in a little late. I did not read it, so I will read that now. And that is from B-Love, our beloved B-Love. Uh, she threw in $5 and said, great stream. Thank you. Well, thank you, B-Love. And again, God bless you and your family. Hope all is well. John David K threw in one dollar and he threw another dollar in. Thank you very much, John David K. Um, and he really, really, really appreciate it, brother. Um, Jimmy threw in 2069. 2069. Luther was a fat bastard that nailed 95 shit posts to a wall and created lukewarm Christianity. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> Well, hello, Jimmy. Uh, thank you very much for that super chat. And that is a, that, it's certainly a uh, funny comment. Uh, <laughs> I guess I wasn't ready for that. Um, I mean, Luther did, he did carry a bit of excess weight, it appeared, based on the paintings we have. But uh, Jimmy, I'll read that one more time through in 2069. Thank you very much, brother. I truly, truly appreciate all your help in, in the group chat and in, in the live chats, uh, just everything you do. Thank you very much, Jimmy. And he threw in 2069, it says, Luther was a fat bastard that nailed 95 ship posts to a wall and created lukewarm Christianity. <laughs> Hi, Patrick. <laughs> oh, geez, that's hilarious. Okay, that was good. Thank you very much, Jimmy. One for the super chat, but that was a very funny, uh, funny comment. John David K. Um, oh, it's day. Oh my gosh, this is John from. John, what's up, my brother? Uh, these are from John. We we did a one on one. Great, great, great guy. Again, brother, I hope all is well with you and your family, and things are going well. Uh, John threw in another dollar. He said, great work. And then he threw in $50. Thank you so much, John, man. Thank you, brother. And he says, thank you for all you do. Keep crushing it. Well, thank you, brother. And I absolutely, absolutely will. Thank you so much, Don, John. Uh, we did a one-on-one, -on -one, had a great, great conversation. Um, you know, ask John if he enjoyed it. Um, I'll let anybody who's done one-on-ones be the testimony, but we, I thought we had a great conversation. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, John, <laughs> man, $50. Thank you, brother. I really, really appreciate that. Thomas Henderson, a uh, good ortho bro, always in the, always in the chat threw an $8 and four cents. And he said, keep driving the snakes out of my brother. Oh, not of. Keep driving the snakes out, my brother. Good stream with lots of content. Weber described the demystification of the West. Enjoy your patron saints day tomorrow. East and West have such a rich history. Uh, I'm sorry. Such a rich legacy of saints from pre uh, Great Schism, 1054 days. Yeah, I totally agree. Thomas, thank you so much, brother, for the 804. Really, really appreciate it. Really appreciate you always being here in the chats and, and the streams. Thank you, man. I really, really do. I'm humbled, humbled that you guys can continue to contribute. I'll keep doing the work. I'll try to put out quality content. Thank you guys for the support. And I want to read that one more time. Thomas Henderson again threw an $8.04 and said, Keep driving the snakes out, my brother. Good stream with lots of content. Weber described the demystification of the West. He did. And so that was another thing. Another book, uh, this is a great point by Thomas Henderson. Um, the demystification of the world or um, the de the disenchantment of the world, I think is the way that actually Weber described it. The disenchantment of the world is what he, he tied to this whole process of rationalization and that what he called the spheres of rationalization is really what we operate in. So we have rationalized, you know, when we, when we engage in capitalism, we have a certain rationale. But when we engage in the home or we engage in church, or we, then we have, we have all these different rationales. He, he basically described the modern world as a broken uh, variety of spheres of rationale. And I think that is true. And he said that the whole rational process led to the disenchantment of the world. And I think that's entirely true. So thank you uh, so much, Thomas. And I absolutely, I'll be going to my pre-sanctified liturgy tomorrow evening and 
celebrating my patron saint's name day, St. Patrick of Ireland. So thank you very much, Thomas Henderson. Hope all is well. God bless you and yours. Pano. Oh, good buddy. Uh, Pano, we missed you this past Sunday, brother. Uh, it's been been nice if you're part of the parish. Uh, Pano throws in $3. He says, as a native Greek, the Protestant work ethic was very awkward for me to reconcile. I always had a vested yearning for meaning and simple mechanistic purposeless productivity always rubbed me the wrong way. I thank God that he's preserved me from this. Great point, Pano. Um, yeah, I, I would say given your Greek culture and your family, um, you know, you're going to have a different perspective on this. For me, it seems so it, for me, this Protestant work ethic is really difficult for me to uh, get out of. It is so imbued in activity as a habit, as, uh, a, again, a way in which I perceive my own activity. One of the quotes that I, I didn't read is he was talking about the active man and that only an, only an observer uh, can be neutral. Um, and so when you're basically, he was, I'm, I'm butchering it, but he was talking about the, uh, how this, this creates an active man. And that before we had men that would contemplate, observe, watch the world. But with the rise of the spirit of capitalism, men don't watch the world. They're too active. And that's why when it comes to doing sedentary activity, they become restless. They don't want to do it because they need to work. They need to do. They need to be active. Um, so that is, I would, you know, that's pretty interesting. But Pano uh, had a great time. I don't know, for you guys that don't know, Pano actually came down to the church and hung out with us over at Subdeacon Marks. We had such a fun time. Such a good guy. Uh, really looking forward to meeting you, meeting you again, brother. Uh, had a good one. So Pano threw in $3 and said, As a native Greek, the Protestant work ethic was very awkward to me to reconcile. I always had a vested yearning for meaning and simple mechanistic purposeless productivity. Always rubbed me the wrong way. I thank God that he's preserved me from this. Thank you, Pano. And Pano threw in another $2 and said, This ethic derived from Scola Scriptura, a way of forensically dividing up the Bible in a way that betrays its living liturgical character. This view then spe oh, then seeped out into the rest of the world, viewing it as just inventory to refine and divide up. Wow, great quote, or I mean, great comment, uh, Pano. Wow. So he threw two and more two more dollars, and he said, "This ethic derives from sola scriptura, a way of forensically dividing up the Bible that betrays its living liturgical character." Agreed. So what what's Pano saying there? That the Bible is a liturgical device. The Bible just isn't something rash. This a rationalistic reading, right? It's actually part of a liturgical celebration. That's its role in the church. It's liturgical and it's the word of God. Yes, you use reason and you engage in it. But what he's saying is the sola scriptura, div divorcing sola scriptura, divorcing scripture now from tradition, it's no longer a liturgical device. Do, do Protestants have a liturgy? No, of course not. So he's absolutely right. And I, sh I didn't even think of that uh, before today's conversation, but this is a great, great comment. This view then seeped out into the rest of the world, viewing all, viewing it all as just inventory to refine and divide up. And that's exactly what it is. I mean, the quote mining of Protestantism is sort of representative of the world in general at this point. So I totally, totally agree with you, Pano. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm on board. Um, so great, great comments, brother. Uh, oh, we got a new Super chat over on YouTube. This is fourteen ninety nine from Bone Man five a five three eight. Thank you so much, brother. And he said, uh, "So it is better to be versus to do if one can afford it." <laughs> uh, oh well, that's hmm, <laughs> that would require me to meditate and think about it a little bit more because that is a deeply philosophical question you're asking. Though it's only a brief little comment. So it is better to be versus do if one can afford it. Um, 
Well, I think we'd have to be careful there because Christ did a lot of doing. Christ was also the sense of the source of being, right? He's the I am, but he's also a carpenter. So he's a builder. He's a healer. He's a teacher. Um, he's a friend. So he's doing a lot of doing too, but, um, I think maybe the idea is to find a middle ground because Christ, Christ also did a lot of praying. He also spent a lot of time in solitude. So Christ was a doer, but he was a contemplator. He also reflected quite a bit. So, um, that's, uh, Hmm. That that is something to really sit and think about for a while, actually, to reflect on. Uh, I wouldn't say it's one over the other. It, it's it's both, right? Because we have to reflect, we have to contemplate, but the world would be a worse place if Christians didn't act. If we didn't do, if we didn't do things in the world with the right intention, I don't see the world getting better. Of course, we already know the end point, you know, things are going to get worse until Christ comes, but we're not as Christians called to not engage with the world. We're not called to give up uh, that. So it, hmm, hmm, this is an interesting idea. Maybe that is, maybe that's a misunderstanding, right? The, the Christian call to never give up uh, is that the, the, the worldly ascetic the worldly asceticism, right, of of working all the time for the Protestant. I wonder if that's an inversion of a sort of never give up, right? You're always supposed to be working towards the kingdom, working towards the goal. I don't know. Interesting stuff there. Um, oh, yeah. P panels. Gosh, great. Yeah, great, great, great uh, point. He says dialectics, bro. And that's what he, Bone Man 538, what he's highlighting is the either or. You see, what I'm trying to do by saying it's both is really highlight one of the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful tendencies of Orthodox theology is that whenever we're, we're juxtaposed to either or, Orthodoxy says both. So is it life and death? Oh, Christ, he did both. He, he's the source of life. He also took on a human body and died, so then he could murder death. <clears throat> so we see always collapsing of dialectics. God, man. Um, so Pano is absolutely right. It's dialectical. We as Orthodox would say, well, you never side on one side of the dialectic. Truth is somehow, again, the logos is the unifier of opposites. Truth is somewhere in the middle of both of those. So it's both faith and works. It's both being and doing. So thank you, Bone Man 538 for the 1499. Thank you very, very much for that contribution, brother. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. And uh, Simon the Amplitude Man, again, appreciate the $5. And Deanna Diaz, thank you very much for the $4.99. I think that is it, guys. Way longer stream than I was anticipating. I thought this was going to be like an hour and a half, two hours, and we are over three hours already. But is anybody surprised? No, uh, not at all. So thank you, guys. Again, let me just double check on the... Uh, Streamlabs that nobody sent in another super chat so I don't skip anybody. And no, we are good. So it looks like we have covered all the super chats. Again, I want to give a major thank you to everybody who has contributed. Uh, thank you guys so much for the support. I, I truly, truly do appreciate it. If you guys would like to become a website member, like I said, I'm going to have three new videos up over at the website this week. One is already up. It's on the nine, uh, nine societal consequences of Protestant theology. I posted that one. Um, so uh, check that one out. I'm also going to be doing one on communion, communication, and community. Uh, that should probably be up Thursday. And then either Thursday or Friday, I'll have a third video up. So three new videos this week, all on the website. Uh, become a member if you'd like to support for five dollars a month would greatly greatly appreciate it and then you can have access to two full video libraries so check that out uh wish you guys the best happy saint patrick's day and um um yeah that basically concludes everything i will be back probably Thursday or Friday with another stream depends on how much of my other work I get done. So smash that like guys. If you didn't 
And if I hope you guys enjoyed tonight's stream, and I will see you next time, which would, like I said, will be Thursday or Friday, and we'll probably do the Amazon, the Junglefication, and uh, the Serpent of Technology. I got a whole host of ideas there that I want to unpack. So I'm really looking forward to that one. That will probably be either um, Thursday or Friday. So thank you guys very much. God bless everyone. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. And as always, until next time, God bless.